Well, hey there, and welcome to a new episode of Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast about movies on the internet that I am aware of and legally allowed to reference. If this is your first visit to this corner of the World Wide Web, let me show you around. There's a rage tweet over there, there's an unpublished picture of my dog, and oh hey, this is the declaration of picking for this show. It says here that we choose a theme, and then we select six movies around that theme to serve as examples. In this case, it's season 19, Die Hard Ons, a six pack of movies that were inspired by Die Hard and then didn't do so good a job when it came time to copy them. This is episode four, Sudden Death, and the first introduction of noted split stewer Jean-Claude Van Damme to our show, and it is about time. But first, like we do with every episode, my pal Chad Cooper is going to kick things off with a little bit of movie knowledge so you can feel better about yourself for listening to a show that's mostly dumb voices and giggling. So, fire up the Zambonis and let's hit the ice for a new episode of the show. Take it away, Chad. So this season, we're taking on six movies that are all rip-offs or drew some level of inspiration from the classic action film Die Hard. And there were a lot of contenders for us to choose from. So just to set the table, let's recap all of the ingredients that you really need for a good Die Hard rip-off. One, a lead character, just a regular old Joe, our John McClane. We're also going to need a substitute for Hans Gruber, the key bad guy in our movie. Preferably, you want somebody with an accent that's not readily found in the United States, maybe Russian or German, Middle Eastern. I know all of this seems real insensitive, but that's what you need for your diehard ripoff. You get together a bunch of bad guys. You can use terrorists or thieves or murdering thugs or some variation thereof. They just got to be up to no good. So you get this regular Joe. Or if you're using a regular Jane herself as the only person who can stop our bad guys from completing their nefarious deeds. You're going to need a fresh batch of innocent people to put in harm's way that may or may not know about the gravity of the situation that could possibly kill them. For seasoning, you may want to toss in an emotional love interest. You can use uh, an estranged wife or a girlfriend, maybe a child. Daughters are pretty good. Mix all this up in a mostly confined location. You bake at 1990 to early 2000s degrees for about 90 to 120 minutes and ding, out pops a fresh baked Die Hard knockoff. And there are a lot of them to feast upon during the last decade of the previous century. Unfortunately, we can only discuss six during this season, but we wanted to give some honorable mention to some of the great Die Hard wannabes that didn't make the cut for season 19. Anna Nicole Smith made a softcore R-rated knockoff of Die Hard called Skyscraper that is pretty much beat for beat an almost exact copy of the movie Die Hard, but with more female nudity. Some here at Pick 6 Movies really lobbied hard to get this one in the final six, but making fun of Anna Nicole Smith's acting and her being dead and all, it was decided for everyone involved that we skip over that one. And speaking of Die Hard knockoffs called Skyscraper, most recently, Dwayne The Rock Johnson made a Die Hard knockoff that was also called Skyscraper in 2018. This Die Hard knockoff had a lot of differences from the original as it added a few hundred more stories to the building's height. Also, The Rock plays a guy with only one leg and the building catches fire. Air Force One is Die Hard on an airplane, but it's not just any airplane. This plane belongs to none other than the President of the United States. Now maybe you're thinking that the President of the United States isn't a regular Joe, but look, hey, in America, anybody can become President, so I'm gonna give a pass that the President is just a regular old guy like you or me. The Hans Gruber in this movie is Gary Oldman playing a character named Ivan. Ooh, that's perfect. Die Hard on a plane, but with snakes? Well, that's snakes on a plane with Samuel L. Jackson. The Hans Gruber in that film is the titular Snakes on the Plane. If you're looking for a diehard knockoff that includes the President of the United States but foregoes air travel, we'll look no further than White House Down. Channing Tatum is our average Joe. In a twist, our bad guy is James Woods. That's nice. And the President is Academy Award winning actor Jamie Foxx. Masterminds is a diehard knockoff at a boarding school with Vincent Carthizer as the teenage skateboarding version of John McClane. Why is Vincent Carthizer's name familiar? Well, he was Pete Campbell on Mad Men, and the Hans Gruber in this movie is none other than Star Trek's own Captain Picard actor Patrick Stewart. 
Die Hard at Six Flags? Look no further than Three Ninjas. High Noon at Mega Mountain. John McClane in this movie is played by three pint-sized kids who know a whole bunch of martial arts. The Hans Gruber here is Lonnie Anderson. And her henchman is none other than Jim Varney. Did I mention that professional wrestler Hulk Hogan plays a character named Dave Dragon in this movie? How this film was not in the mix this season? Well, even we have standards. Icebreaker. That's Die Hard at a Ski Lodge. John McClane here is played by actor Sean Astin. And the Hans Gruber is none other than Bruce Campbell. Speaking of Sean Astin, he teamed up with a whole bunch of other teenage hunks in Toy Soldiers, which was pretty much just Die Hard at a prep school for troubled boys. The Hans Gruber here, Wishmaster villain Andrew Divoff, as a Colombian terrorist using a terrible Latino accent. Die Hard at a beauty pageant, we got you covered in No Contest, starring former Playboy playmate Shannon Tweed as the John McClane. When terrorists try to take over the Miss Galaxy beauty pageant, the Hans Gruber in this one, Andrew Dice Clay. Also, Rowdy Roddy Piper shows up in there as well. Good God. Die Hard at a Mall? Well, that's Paul Blart Mall Cop. John McClane here is played by the King of Queens himself, Kevin James. Hans Gruber in this one is I don't know, because I never saw that movie. And there were all kinds of TV shows that cranked out episodes that were all Die Hard inspired, including Alias, Almost Human, Angel, Battlestar Galactica, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Burn Notice, Third Rock from the Sun, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Dexter's Laboratory, Mad About You, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, South Park, The Simpsons, The Cleveland show and family guy and there's a whole bunch more that i'm just too lazy to mention over on netflix you can find a movie called game over which is a parody of die hard made by those guys who were on the comedy central show workaholics and recently the movie love hard came out which is a romantic comedy inspired by die hard and love actually yeah i didn't see it either and there's all kinds of diehard references and TV shows and movies left and right. 22 Jump Street, the animated movie Rio, The Office, Parks and Recreation, the 2001 PlayStation game Spider-Man 2 Inner Electro, the show Friends, the animated show The Fairly Odd Parents, the animated show Bob's Burgers actually has a diehard musical in an episode. But some of you out there are saying, hey, Chad, I didn't come here to hear about all the diehard knockoffs you're not reviewing this season. So quit with the not this, not that. Let's get to the focus of this episode, sudden death. And to those two or three anxious listeners out there who are thinking or saying those things I just said, you know what? You're right. Let's do this. Change the music. We're talking about sudden death. Karen Elise Baldwin was an actress early in her career. She had small parts in the film Who's That Girl with Madonna. She also had a small part in the movie Spellbinder starring Tim Daly and Kelly Preston and the erotic thriller The Jigsaw Murders starring 70s TV icon Chad Everett. She appeared in the movie Eyewitness to Murder, which starred Adrian Smed. And in this, she had a slightly larger part and she also got a story by credit on the film. Next, she landed a small part on the soap opera Generations. She had a recurring role in the TV series Dangerous Women in 1991. Her career in front of the camera and behind the camera producing TV shows and motion pictures remained at a steady level of growing success. Then Karen Elise Baldwin had an idea for a movie. What if somebody made Die Hard, but set it in a hockey ring? There were all kinds of diehard knockoffs hitting theaters left and right, but this budding genre of film had yet to take place in an indoor sports arena. Now, I'm sure that quite a few people had similar ideas about a diehard knockoff, but Karen Elise Baldwin was uniquely positioned to pitch this movie because her husband was Howard Baldwin, who was then the chairman slash owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins and had a two-year contract with Universal Pictures. Karen Elise Baldwin, she had the Pittsburgh Penguins in her pocket. She had access to the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, which had a roof that opened up. That's pretty cool. And she thought, hey, what if we pepper in real hockey players to up the authenticity of the movie? Die Hard movies are all over the place. Why not make Die Hard at a hockey game? Heck, we'll set it at the National Hockey League playoffs during game seven. That's it, baby, now we're cooking. Howard Baldwin wanted to use actual hockey game footage in the movie. Is it game footage or is it match footage? I don't know. Howard Baldwin wanted to use footage from the October 1st game opener between the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Chicago Blackhawks, but that match was delayed due to the 1994-95 NHL lockout. Not to be deterred, Howard Baldwin set up an exhibition game involving hockey players 
from the Johnsonville Chiefs and the Wheeling Thunderbirds. Which is why, if you ever watch this movie, please don't, all of the shots with the Penguins and the Blackhawks playing hockey don't really contain the same type of intensity that a normal hockey match would. Is it a match? Is it a game? Hockey match, hockey game. All right, all right just keep going. We got hockey players on the ice, check. Getting people into the crowd to simulate game seven of the National Hockey League Championship, that was another issue. The crowd shots in the stadium were done over one night using about two to 3,000 extras, along with a lot of cardboard cutouts to make the stadium seem like it was full of 17,000 people. All right, let's do the math. <clears throat> 17,000 people in the stand, okay. We have, mm, let's call it 3,000 extras, all right which means we need 14,000 cardboard cutouts of fans in the stadium. Hmm. Well, that'll work. And also, these 14,000 cutouts were not of different people. If you ever watch this movie, please don't, you see the same cutouts of people repeated over and over in the stands. It is a thing of beauty. I love this terrible movie. Screenwriting credit for the film went to Gene Quintano. You know, Gene Quintano, the man who penned the screenplays for Police Academy 3, Back in Training, Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol, Police Academy 5, Assignment, Miami Beach. How did Gene Quintano come to write Sudden Death? Well, according to writer Randy Feldman, the first draft of the screenplay was a comedy action parody. And it turns out that the only scene from that script that made its way into the final film is a fight between our movie's hero and the Pittsburgh Penguin mascot, Iceberg. More on that when Bo gets here in a few minutes. Sudden Death was shot at Pittsburgh's old Civic Arena. The building was known as the Igloo because, well, it looked like an igloo. In addition to this, the filmmakers got quite a few Penguins players and team staff to appear in the film. Luke Robitaille, Jay Caulfield, Mark Kachowski. Full disclosure, I have no idea if I said those names correctly or even if they are real people. The movie's finale involved a helicopter crash inside the Civic Arena, which required the use of a 400-foot crane to pick up and lower the helicopter back down into the arena. Nine cameras were used to capture the finale, which was filmed multiple times with a lot of emergency vehicles on standby in case things didn't go according to plan, which it turns out they did because no Nobody died during the helicopter heavy finale of Sudden Death. Unlike you, Twilight Zone the movie. Yeah, go think about what you did. Uh-huh, you could learn something from Sudden Death the movie with a crane. Safety first, people. To play the movie's lead, all the usual suspects were considered. Schwarzenegger and Stallone and Bruce Willis, but they are like, no, we're not doing that. So the movie lands with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Van Damme was born Jean-Claude Camille Francois Van Verenberg. That's classy. He was born in Brussels, Belgium in 1960, and in his youth, he took up martial arts. And then he moved to the United States to become a movie star at the age of 22. And guess what? That happened. <laughs> his first American role was in the 1984 breakdancing-infused movie Breakin', where he played spectator in first dance sequence. Four years later, he starred in the movie Bloodsport in 1988, and then a year later in Kickboxer, Double Impact in 91. A year later, he was in Universal Soldier with Dolph Lundgren. Next came Hard Target, then Time Cop in 1985, where he teamed up with director Peter Hyam. You know Peter Hyam, director of 2010, The Year We Make Contact, the sequel to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Come on, Peter Hyam, he directed Running Scared with Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines, certified fresh by Mr. Bo Ransdell and yours truly. He, he directed Stay Tuned with John Ritter and Pam Dauber. Ugh. You clearly don't remember the days of blockbuster video. <laughs> Peter Hyam made Time Cop with Jean-Claude Van Damme, and that movie was pretty successful. It was about a cop who traveled in time to solve time cop crimes or something. I saw it, but I don't remember anything about it. Following the success of that movie, Peter Hyam and Jean-Claude Van Damme, they were tapped to bring the diehard at a hockey game to the silver screen. The movie's bad guy, Joshua Floss, is that the bad guy's name in this movie? I don't remember that at all. He was originally to be played by James Woods, but it turned out that he didn't like the direction that the character went. I guess he was a little too liberal or something. The role ultimately went to Powers Booth, who rose to fame with his Emmy award-winning 
portrayal of famed cult leader Jim Jones in a CBS TV movie of the week. Powers Booth had a string of roles in the 80s and 90s, including an appearance in the 1993 Western Tombstone. He was in the Oliver Stone film Nixon, but I think everybody was in that movie. Then he landed the role of the bad guy in the Die Hard at a Hockey Game movie that we're about to talk about. They also got Powers Booth to read the audio book of the novelization of the film Sudden Death. See, that's what happens when you don't read all of your contract before you sign it. Mara Wilson, the little girl from Mrs. Doubtfire and that remake of Miracle on 34th Street. She was also Matilda in the movie Matilda. Filmmakers wanted her to play the role of Emily, the daughter of Jean-Claude Van Damme's character, but her parents read this script and said, are you out of your mind? Our kids are gonna be in this movie? So the role landed in the lap of Whitney Wright, fresh off her turn, co-starring with Nick Nolte in the James L. Brooks film, I'll Do Anything. Sudden Death opened in the United States on December 22nd in 1995, and it came in eighth place with just about five million bucks in box office receipts for opening weekend, which kind of sucked because it was in almost like 3,000 theaters. All in all, the movie raked in about $20 million in the United States. It did better overseas and ended up making a haul of about 64 million bucks. And with home video sales thrown in, the movie actually netted about $50 million in profit. When the film came out, it received mixed reviews, which don't most most movies receive mixed reviews. Anyway, it currently holds a 50% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes. That feels generous. Assumed cheesecake aficionado Roger Ebert gave sudden death three and a half stars out of four. Oh my God. Roger Ebert said of the movie, sudden death isn't about common sense. It's about the manipulation of action and special effect sequences to create a thriller effect. And it's pretty good. That statement only makes sense when you pepper in a bunch of air quotes. There were never plans for a sequel, but in 2020, Netflix dropped a remake of Sudden Death titled Welcome to Sudden Death, starring Michael Jai White. And this time the movie takes place at a basketball game and it has more of a comic angle due to the fact that original screenwriter Gene Quintano returned to bang out this script. Do they even have Sudden death in basketball games? Is that a thing? All right, all right. That movie has a 23% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes, so it stinks more than the original. Who thought that remaking Sudden Death would be a good idea? Maybe it was the people in the finance department who saw those net box office receipts. <laughs> For budding movie actress term film producer Karen Elise Baldwin, Sudden Death was the start of a very successful movie career behind the camera. She went on to produce such films as the ice hockey comedy Mystery Alaska, starring Russell Crowe and Burt Reynolds. She was also producer on Ray Charles' biopic Ray, where Jamie Foxx won his Oscar for portraying the famous singer. Good, good for her, good for you, good for me. Speaking of things that are good for everybody, let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to lace up his skates, grab his stick, and head down on the ice as we puck off for about 90 minutes and break down this movie scene by scene to see if it's any good. Spoilers, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Zambonis and Zamboners, let's get our die hard on with 1995's Sudden Death. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper. And as always, I am joined by the Wayne Gretzky to my Gordy Howe, the only two professional hockey players I know. It's Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing this evening? Very good. Yeah, I know Gordy Howe thanks to The Simpsons. <laughs> I know Wayne Gretzky because of Wayne's World. Yeah, the, <laughs> we'll get to it in a bit. But there, there are moments in this movie where uh, real hockey players maybe do cameos. Yeah, they do. And I was like, this is totally lost on me. I have no idea idea who these people are you they could be actors they could be extras they could be people you pulled in from the bus station they clearly didn't get them at the dentist yeah <laughs> yeah that's true the thing is i've been to honest to goodness hockey games uh-huh 
and they're fun. I, I enjoy watching hockey live, probably more than any other sport I've seen played live, even though I have no understanding of the rules or any of the players or anything like that. But it is a fun sport right. to watch. Hockey is the craps of professional sports. There's a lot going on. People are screaming and yelling. Money's exchanging hands, but you don't really understand any of it. You would have to really go over it a couple of times to get me to understand <laughs> exactly how icing works. I, I know that gets called. Old, uh, a lot when I was watching hockey and I was like what happened nobody touched it at a certain point and then they waited too long and then they crossed the line all right you're just gonna have to step on my foot and tell me that it's icing and I'll repeat it back to you had you ever seen this movie before it was pitched for this unfortunate episode no <laughs> which is weird because I genuinely kind of like Peter Hyams as a director <laughs> and he also does his own cinematography and I think saving a couple of bucks or cashing a couple of checks ka-ching ka-ching i think that's more what it is but also his movies have a very distinct look it's fairly easy to say that this is a peter hyams movie because of the way that it looked 2010 and running scared and this all have a similar cinematic vocabulary. I could see that. I saw it for the first time about five years ago because it looked terrible and I was in the mood for some 90s era action trash and this was available on some streaming service and from start to finish I was not disappointed and I wasn't this go round either. This movie's terrible but in all the right ways. I would agree with that. I think of the movies we've discussed so far this may be my favorite. We've got some good ones to come. Yeah. And by good ones I mean terrible movies. <laughs> but but this one feels the most like a movie of everything we discuss. Like Cliffhanger isn't really a movie. It just <laughs> pretends like it is. Whereas this feels like, oh, okay, well, we've got in 90s action terms, like actual characters that are two-dimensional, sure, but I understand who they are and what they want right. and what the stakes are. And the villain is, look, Powers Booth, I love anyway. Sure. But his performance in this as being just a psychopath path uh-huh totally down for it i love everything about powers booth in this movie from the first time he steps on screen i'm like okay now we got something now th now we're talking pick six movies enough <laughs> enough of the fucking around with all the <laughs> <laughs> cliffhangers and die hard twos and uh, all that shit this is a real honest to goodness villain no naked colonels running around in this one just a a well quaffed a well-dressed sadist and that's all I need out of him. Yeah, he's one. almost like a James Bond villain in this. He is. I wish he had more room to kind of spread his wings and be real mustache twirling. Nah. But eh, what he does here is totally fine. But the majority of the film, he's just leaning against a bar drinking a highball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty good as far as villains go. Of, Hang on, what's going on downstairs? I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> clink, 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 clink. Do, do you do you know many Jean-Claude Van Damme movies? No, I have not seen much Jean-Claude Van Damme I think all. I saw Bloodsport, because that was the one that had that compound fracture. It was that movie that walked around talking about how the karate kid was a pussy. I'll show you how to sweep a leg. Attack! I've seen Hard Target because Wilford Brimley is in it. <laughs> and that is high on the list for movies we need to do on, the, uh, on this show one day. And I've seen Time Cop, and I think that's it. I remember him doing those splits, which seemed to be wedged into every early movie he made whenever possible. And he doesn't do his splits in this one, which was a little surprising. I guess they didn't want to see his balls go <laughs> spilling out on screen. <laughs> Let's jump into this one. Our movie opens up and Jean-Claude Van Damme, he gets top billing, of course. Then we get our movie's title, then Powers Booth, then a string of names that nobody knows. And then finally the movie starts and we're at a house fire in the suburbs of some city. A title overlay would be nice jackasses the whole movie takes place in <laughs> pittsburgh just start off and say that tell us where we are i guess the fact that the pittsburgh penguins are the focus and it's the civic center there and all of that i guess that ticks that box but as someone who does not understand hockey or where it's played and where the teams come from i totally agree i wish that somebody had been like Psst, this is philadelphia where it's always sunny it's pittsburgh it's not <laughs> It's not Philadelphia. Wherever. Aren't they the Philadelphia Flyers, though? No, it's the Pittsburgh Penguins. He fights a penguin. Oh, I didn't put that connection together. 
<laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, wait, wait. What, what movie did were we supposed to watch? I think I may have watched the wrong movie. Is there one where Jean-Claude Van Damme fights a flyer? No, no it's D2, The Mighty Ducks 2. That's what we were watching. <laughs> oh, all right. I was wondering why he was beating up Emilio Estevez, but that makes more sense now. I thought I was watching Men at Work 2. We watch a bunch of firefighters rush into these buildings as flames lick out of the windows and doors like they do in movies where they're pretending to have a real fire, but it's not. And off in the distance, we hear this voice scream out, Bonjour, mes amis. <laughs> I mean, hello, fellow Pittsburgh firefighters. I have found the little girl. Your help is needed, huh? Aidez-moi, aidez-moi. <laughs> It is me, Jean-Claude Van Damme, the star of the movie. I am over here. I have a little girl uh, on fire, uh, as you say here in America, in, in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, wherever we are. <laughs> the camera makes its way through this house fire, and we finally find Jean-Claude Van Damme, and he's lying on the ground, and as you say, he's holding this small, blonde-haired little girl in his arms in a somewhat protective way. And I say somewhat, because as soon as we, the audience, show up, the ceiling of this house house that is on fire crumbles in flames and ash in this avalanche yeah. of holy shit jean Claude van damme and this kid just got killed in our movie well it turns out we're half right chad <laughs> did you not think when you saw this crushing pile of burning embers and wood and asbestos land down on them that it, arguably they're both dead right well i knew because i've seen movies before I'm like well jean Claude van damme clearly not gonna die in the first scene of this movie in which he stars. Well, they could have given you an overlay that said two years ago. And you're like, oh shit, that's the end of our movie. That's where we're going with it. Oh, right. They pause. I bet you're wondering how I ended up here. <laughs> I was born a poor black child. This little girl, she is, how you say, la meat d'amour. <laughs> so a bunch of other firefighters show up and they spray hoses and they pull rubble off of Jean-Claude Van Damme. And then they show us the little girl and surprises of surprises, Bo, this child is dead we're like two minutes into this movie and we got a dead kid yeah and because i'm just like a terrible terrible person i will automatically give one star to a movie that kills a child in the first five minutes <laughs> because i think it's bold and it's audacious and this movie comes out swinging by murdering a young white girl immediately so i'm like well you know it's it's that dicaprio meme of you have my attention movie <laughs> we paid to black and then we get a title overlay that says two years later then we get another title overlay that says game day i'm like wait what game are we talking about then we get another title overlay that says four hours till face off movie you were assuming that everyone in the audience knows how hockey works i assume that this movie would play for four hours and then the nicholas cage <laughs> John Travolta right. film would begin. <laughs> it really thinks that the people watching the film know what a Stanley Cup is. They know that there are seven games, you know, in the series. How many periods are in a hockey game? I know almost nothing about hockey. <laughs> You think for the uninitiated of the movie, you would at least break down the basic rules like they did for Whack Bad or Quidditch. <laughs> I don't even know what Whack Bad is. It's from Fantastic Mr. Fox. Oh, right, right. Okay, yeah, it, it's it might as well be Calvin Ball. I agree. You get the scene where Jean Claude Van Damme shows up in a minute to you know pick up his kids, and that's the point that they should have dumped all the information. Maybe not how many periods are in it, but like when he's talking to his wife, that's a perfect opportunity opportunity for a character in the movie to be the audience surrogate to be like let's pretend that i know nothing about hockey or how it works <laughs> so when are you gonna have the kids back home why after the third period that is how many periods are in a hockey game oh. so we're in pittsburgh yes <laughs> in Philadelphia. I, I, even though i will insist on that throughout the the <laughs> course of this episode yes no it's game seven of the national hockey league championship and whoever wins gets to be king shit for the year and in this case we are watching the pittsburgh penguins play the chicago blackhawks and then we meet this guy named hallmark who at first i thought he was the guy running the show at the hockey arena or maybe he was the head of security but it turns out that since i read the plot summary over on wikipedia i know that hallmark is a secret service agent 
Asia, who's there to make sure that nothing happens to the vice president. And here we get a little chatter that the vice president uh, of the United States, just to clarify that, <laughs> will mm -hmm. be in attendance. So security is extra high. I like when we come into this scene and you see this bank of monitors looking over everything, that there is an 80 yard line of a woman saying, I want to see everything that God sees. And I was like, that means me masturbating. <laughs> every, every time I jerk off, that's the first thing I think of is dead relatives and the Lord God observing me. That's how I can finish. <laughs> I like that you think the creator of the heavens and the earth has nothing better to do than to watch you spank it. Hey, look, everybody needs to treat themselves occasionally. <laughs> like he's got a lot on his plate. And so why wouldn't occasionally be like, you know what? Let's it's a treat yourself day. I'm going to have a cup of Earl Grey and watch this chubby fella rub one out. Well, you know what? Um, good for you. <laughs> So a couple of uh, security guards are in a car and they're driving along and they approach this work van that's got like a gravel road blocked in downtown Pittsburgh. And then a separate car crashes into the back of the security guards car. And this guy who gets out, he looks like a dirty, drunken Bono. He hops out of the passenger side of the car and he says, uh, my dog's lost. Uh, I can't find him. Do you know where my dog is? And they're like, Hi, are you drunk Bono? He's like, no, 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 but I've got an Uzi. And they kill the security guard guards and steal their ids which look real easy to fake in my opinion Bo. yeah there's a whole other scene here in a minute where they're going about that very thing i don't think the movie never explains this but i kind of wondered is this a situation where they needed to get a template of the id so that they could make a bunch of fake ones for their team they get security guard id so bad guys can get in the arena we cut to jean-claude van damme and he's getting out of his red ford mustang that's nice and he approaches his son tyler who looks to be about 10 years old and he's playing street hockey with his balding stepfather michael mm -hmm. and tyler sees his dad and he says uh, jean-claude van damme i mean dad and he runs over and gives him a big hug and then jean-claude van damme's ex-wife kathy with an eye she sticks her head out the door and she says, John Claude Van Damme, what the fuck are you doing here? We're getting ready to leave. It's Tyler's 10th birthday. You're not supposed to be here till tomorrow. And John Claude Van Damme says, uh -huh, honey, the woman who bought me two children, Tyler, and one we will meet in a moment. Well, today is the day of his birth. And I thought maybe I could show up and surprise him and you and your balding new husband, Michael. I like the fact that she is put out as she is like, this is bullshit. We talked about this. You're not supposed to show up out of the blue. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to the kids. Nobody knows what you've got on your mind. You're a real son of a bitch. You think I don't know what my own goddamn son's birthday is? I was there when he was born. Unlike some people, asshole. Hey, there was a fire. What was I going to do? Yeah, fire. Sitting around looking at porn, hoping that the Lord was watching you jerk off at the fire station. There were no fires that day. I looked at the log. I found it exciting. <laughs> what can I say? Look, we got in this new hockey stick. We made a reservation at Buffalo Wild Rings to watch game seven of the NHL playoffs happen here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, between the Penguins and the Blackhawks. So why don't you beat it, mister? Van Dam says, oh, <laughs> that sounds like a very good time, but... Look at this. I have these tickets to the final hockey competition tonight. I thought that the boy Tyler, who I am the father of, would enjoy seeing the game live and in person, as opposed to being surrounded by drunken ne'er-do-wells. Michael, the stepfather, yeah. wisely stays out of all of this. He's just quietly observing, because he doesn't want to get in touch with the missus, but I'm sure he's like, you know, if he takes these kids, I might get a little action tonight. I mean, we're, yes, we're all middle-aged here, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that I don't want to fuck this woman I married recently. <laughs> <laughs> My stepdad, Michael, does chime in. Hey, I, I heard that the vice president of the United States will be attending. You know, for anybody who was late coming into the theater because you were getting snacks in the lobby or possibly smoking marijuana in the parking lot. Nobody was talking to you, Michael. <laughs> sorry, sorry. How about you shut up? <laughs> sorry, I'm just gonna... I would kick you right in the face. I don't know if she told you, but I know some karate. Uh, yes, I've seen your other movies. <laughs> Whoa, you are very flexible. That's really been a lot to live up to, to be a, between you, between men, between <laughs> us 
like your flexibility has set a an unrealistic <laughs> bar in the bedroom. Oh, I know. If only I had not split my balls open doing all them tricks, maybe we'd still be married. Oh. Yeah, I think stepdad Michael pulled out his back trying to put on a sock one day. And she's like, Jesus Christ. Kathy with an eye, you can sure pick them, can't you? This is a real step down from Jean-Claude Van Damme. Like, no offense to Michael, who I'm sure is a wonderful guy, uh-huh. but a superhero, amazingly flexible firefighter. And Michael's just like, uh, you know, mostly I'm just pushing some papers around here at the insurance company, but uh, it's a good job. You know, middle management is where I aimed and that's where I landed. And I'm happy with the decisions i've made i i don't know how i convinced this one to marry me but i'm pretty pleased so the movie introduces us to a second child the eight-year-old little girl named emily she runs out and she says daddy daddy and then she stops and she uses sign language to say i love you because she's been hanging out with Drew from Speed 2, you know? <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Or Jason Patrick. Yeah, and then Tyler, the older brother, says, she's practicing to be deaf. I'm like, you, what? <laughs> well, look, I wasn't going to bring it up, but her hearing's really been going. So we, we figured we'd get proactive with it, start giving her some sign language lessons. No, I, I think it might be all the loud music that we're playing. <laughs> Gee, sorry, honey. I just like when I get home, I like a little Megadeth. I can't help it. <laughs> Tyler goes on to say, hey, you're wearing my Pittsburgh penguins hat on your head that's gross and the pittsburgh penguins are playing tonight in the national hockey league's final game to win the stanley cup where the vice president of the united states is also going to be in attendance and then kathy with an eye says jean-claude van Dien, you can't just show up here because it's tyler's birthday all right i already mentioned we got that reservation at bwd it's non-refundable plus you only got two tickets asshole what are you going to take one of them and leave another one with me bullshit you're taking both of these little bastards if you're taking one of them and Jean-Claude Van Damme says, oh, I have got that all figured out. I am working at the arena tonight. Two tickets is all I need for both my son and my daughter. Did I mention it is our son's birthday? So the the son, by the way, Tyler, visibly disappointed that his father is no longer like a fireman. Tyler jumps in and says, you're back to work, dad? And it's Michael, the stepdad, who chimes in. Well, yeah, champ, your father's the fire inspector at the hockey arena. It's real important work, Tyler. I mean, not as important as pushing papers down at the insurance company, but Tyler, you should be proud of your pop, you know? The recovery made after having that little girl get crushed to death in his arms a couple of years ago when he was a firefighter. Boy, did I mention the vice president's going to be at the game tonight? It's game seven of the National Hockey League Championship between the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Chicago Blackhawks. Tyler is just crestfallen hearing this of just like, oh, right, I forgot for a second that my dad's a sack of shit. <laughs> he is unimpressed. Kathy with an I finally says, all right, Jean-Claude Van Damme, don't pull this shit again. All right, me and Michael, we're going to go to B-Dub 3s and we're just, we're going to get hammered on, on Ice House and probably take a cab back home and do some weird stuff in the bedroom. Hopefully God won't be watching because we got four days till church and I'm going to get some more sin in in between now and then. Anyway, look, don't ever do this shit again. Take the kids. Happy birthday, T-Man. All right. We'll see you in a day or two, probably. You know, listen, just to keep the air clear here nothing too crazy because you know i pulled my hammy taken out the trash the other night so maybe you get on top tonight <laughs> shut up shut up don't let him hear that i want him to be jealous he's certainly not gonna be jealous at the reality we get to this warehouse where we see our group of thugs and they're toting out these clear garbage bag sized bundles of popcorn which i was like why would any arena import popcorn they have the means to make that on site, but again, small detail. So the bad guys here, they got a bunch of guns and they're doctoring these stolen IDs that they nabbed from that slaughter incident on the gravel road. And they're putting their headshots on top of it to make it all look wink, wink, legit. And then Powers Booth shows up wearing a tuxedo looking like a million bucks. Ugh. Powers Booth sets a five minute timer next to a stuffed penguin that's holding a hockey stick in its hands and then everybody scatters and then the camera returns back to the penguin and the penguin not so much explodes as it just kind of bursts open with a poof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but everybody is on their way uh, and then we get an insert saying two hours until face off. <laughs> like, oh, I like that movie. It's better than this. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, Nicholas Cage coming on to that little girl when he's in the priest outfit at the beginning of that movie. That's creepy, gross. right? Yeah. And so we cut back to Hallmark, who is taking his Dr. Phil stand in uh -huh. through this kitchen to a private elevator yeah. where he's uh, basically setting up. There is only one entrance to this private box through this elevator. There's a security key that Hallmark hands over to this security guard. And we also meet Chef Andrew Boyardee for the first time, who <laughs> is the the cook uh, who is, is making dinner for the vice president and his guests. Yes. And he is like, oh boy, I'm going to make a good dinner for everybody. Hallmark <laughs> says, this guy is going to be our point man down here. Do not let anyone onto that elevator that Chef Andrew Boyardee does not say is one of his people or belongs on that elevator. Mm. Everybody got that? Everybody cool? Think about that. The head <laughs> of the Secret Service is letting the head chef, and I'm using that term loosely, at the uh -huh. Civic Auditorium <laughs> like be the gatekeeper of who gets to go up to see the vice president. He's like, Mamma mia, this is a lot of responsibility. I thought all I was going to have to do is make a little shrimp cocktail. It's a mess, but then we get seemingly an unrelated scene that will find out later isn't so unrelated uh -huh. where we cut to this old woman just gardening in front of her house uh -huh. this dude shows up who looks like he stepped out of a john waters audition yeah i felt that he was in search of or just recently departed a zoot suit riot absolutely and he shows up and flashes the gun tucked into his belt yeah, he's like hey are you Dorothy Boyardee, wife of famed Civic Arena head chef Andrew Boyardee? Look, I got a gun. We're going to go inside now before things get messy. So they go inside. Then we get another insert. 90 minutes to face off. <laughs> like, holy shit. Like, this game's getting close. This movie's really moving. <laughs> Why is time so important in this movie? They do this a lot, but yeah. none of it really matters. I thought I was blacking out again, but <laughs> it turns out it was not. Jean-Claude Van Damme, he shows up at the game. He's outside, and he walks up with his kids, and they go through security, and it's here we see Emily has this hand stamp, and she stamps one of the guys working security and it's a little cute exchange and then right behind him drunk bono and some other henchmen show up with their fake ids and they get down without any trouble inside the theater jean-claude van damme he sees joan who is the woman that dresses up as iceberg the oversized penguin mascot of the pittsburgh penguins and mm -hmm. joan has long blonde hair and she walks over and she says hi jean-claude van damme are you working tonight He's the fire marshal, right? That's his mm -hmm. job. Why would she be surprised that he's working game seven of the National Hockey League Championship? I don't think that Joan understands the basics of hockey either. I think she's just trying to make some small talk because clearly they've hooked up at some point. But he's still upset about the breakup with his marriage and hasn't committed to anything. But she's like, you know, I kind of like the idea of being married to a firefighter slash fire marshal. And he's just a little too distant and she's trying to bridge that gap. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is the first time she gets to meet his kids so she's trying to be a little like over effusive that and be sense. really friendly and welcoming uh, some of this chad may in fact be subtext <laughs> but i feel like that's what's that, that's the dynamic uh in this situation he does say to her bonjour jean will you give emily my daughter a look at icy the mascot of the penguins i do not know why i refer to him as icy even though his real name is iceberg but <laughs> it does not matter I will take my son Tyler. Did you know it is his birthday? Uh, I'm going to take him down to the locker room to meet some of the hockey players, let him get some cameos. I do not want my eight year old daughter to come along as she might see some giant dongs flipping and flopping all over the place, okay? Oh, you should have told me. I could have picked him up a little present. Oh, you know, let me stop you right there, John. Uh, we are not there yet where you are buying gifts <laughs> for my kids yet. Maybe someday. Probably not between you and me. Is it okay if I get your daughter a soda? Something like that? Maybe, you know, write my phone number on a piece of paper and snick it into her back pocket? Let me give you some money. You don't have to pay for anything. I will... Okay. Yeah, I think you get it. <laughs> sure enough, Jean-Claude Van Damme takes his shitty kid into this locker room where they meet hockey superstar question mark Luke Robitaille. Uh, okay. That Jean-Claude Van Damme is like, Oh, the Oh, what the what the Yeah. Uh, they talk a little French back and forth. And the kid is like, I bet they're planning on killing me. <laughs> 
there's a moment where the kid outs Jean-Claude Van Damme in front of this goalie yeah. where he's like, oh, you don't look washed up and old. And he's like, what? And he's like, My dad says that you're too old to be playing the game anymore. And in a bit of foreshadowing, I guess, this goalie gives him like a gap tooth grin and says, you know what? You tell your dad to strap on uh, some skates and then he can see the kind of game that we play. Yeah. There's also a moment where one of the hockey players says to Tyler, hey, do you play hockey? And Tyler says, no, nah, but my dad did. He was a goalie. And you're like, wait, what? So he was a fireman. And he's a fire marshal, but he also used to play hockey and he was a goalie. That's right. <laughs> I played semi-pro in Canada, but that was a long time ago before this one came along and ruined everything. There is a point we will get to in this movie where they capitalize on this in the most unnecessary moment of the film where you're like, wait a second, you've got other things to be doing other than worrying about your hockey glory days. Uh, uh, agreed. We'll get to it. But in, importantly, Chad, we get another insert. 45 minutes to face off. <laughs> the bad guys show up in a snack truck and they're unloading all of their bundles of popcorn which i'm pretty sure contain guns inside them jean-claude van damme and tyler they meet back up with emily his daughter and with joan who is now wearing the cartoon mascot iceberg outfit they're down like in the lower tunnels she goes off on her way to create mayhem for the enjoyment of all of the attendees of game seven of the national hockey league championship between the pittsburgh penguins and the chicago blackhawks cut to the kitchen where Chef Andrew Boyardee, who is world-renowned for his culinary abilities, Bo, mm -hmm. he's using a butcher cleaver to chop an onion. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, so you just want a little flair, right? See, I was thinking that perhaps his katana sword or chainsaw <laughs> were somehow unavailable for such delicate knife work. The samurai was unavailable <laughs> uh, because of him working at Samurai Delicatessen, so they had to get <laughs> Chef Andrew Boyardee rd in here and his only tool is a cleaver but yeah so he's he's showing this little trick where he just throws this cleaver up in the air around children uh-huh uh, and it lands, you know, like sticking out the butcher board. And that's just to remind us like, hey, there's a cleaver here for later when there was a fight scene in this movie. Did they use the cleaver later in the fight scene? Briefly, not as much as you would hope. Because I was like, oh, if that cleaver ends up in somebody's skull, we've already killed a kid. <laughs> somebody getting cleaved in twain in the skull is also a star on the Bo Ransdell scale of motion picture uh, reviewing. Jean-Claude Van Damme walks over to do his job. And there's this red light above a fire alarm that's burned out. And Jean Claude Van Damme says, ha oh, ha oh, oh. Chef Andrew Boyardi, you have a light bulb out. That is a violation of the fire code of which I enforce. And Chef Andrew Boyardi says, ah, he says, Mamma mia, Jean-Claude Van Damme, can you change it? My hands are full of onions and giant meat cleavers. And then Emily turns to her brother Tyler and says, is that what daddy does? He changes light bulbs? And I'm like, this both is and isn't a stupid question because she has no <laughs> idea what her dad does for a living. And Tyler is pretty quick to defend him here no 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 that does he, he's a fireman he does all kinds of cool shit but inside you could tell he's dying a little bit <laughs> and then we get yet another insert chad 20 minutes to face off this movie is like a mom constantly shouting out how much time there is before we gotta leave kids we got 20 minutes till the movie starts start shutting down your computer games we don't want to be late all right i'm trying to get to a save point i don't care who has to save what and where this movie starts in 20 minutes i don't want to get there late we're gonna miss the first part of it we're not gonna know what the hell's going on these movies these days don't have the goddamn decency to repeat important plot points for people like us that show up 15 20 minutes late if i get there and i don't know how many periods are in a hockey game i'm holding you responsible mister god just give me a minute I should, i'm almost at a checkpoint i'm gonna check your point <laughs> So the vice president arrives in a convoy of black sedans and motorcycles uh, and whatnot. Hallmark is in the control trailer getting a report like the vice president's here. He's like, yeah, I figure I saw the cars. Also, do you know it's 20 minutes till face off? <laughs> and then we cut back to the old woman who is being held at gunpoint in her own home. Mm -hmm. The zoot suit thug is like, hey, 
uh, you got any cookies? And she's like, um, I guess I have some Fig Newtons, which means the answer to that question is no, Chad. Fig Newtons are not cookies. Never the twain shall meet. <laughs> I've got those weird little seeds and it's like a cake or something. Yeah, it's the kind of shit that only old people have and they generally serve it when company comes over alongside coffee yeah. as a subtle nudge for them to never come <laughs> back again. Give me some Chips Ahoy, some EL Fudge. Hell, I'll take a graham cracker over a Fig Newton any day. You give me some off-brand chocolate chip cookies, like instead of Chips Ahoy, it's like Chip Mates or whatever. <laughs> uh, whatever, just an actual honest-to-goodness cookie, not a Fig Newton. Did you know that for a fig to gestate properly, a wasp has to die inside it? No. Yeah, that's true. Or it seems like something I read one time. I didn't verify that, but I think that's true, and that's gross, and that's another reason that Fig Newton should be banned. Right alongside uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved and that graphic novel about the Holocaust with all the cats and mice, Mouse? Fig Newtons should be banned. Yeah, throw those on a fire. It might smell better. They'd probably explode. <laughs> Here's another fun fact. The woman playing Dorothy Boyardee is Audra Lindley, who was Mrs. Roper on the sitcom Three's Company. Yeah. <laughs> if only uh, Norman Fell had been around. <laughs> That would have been more Rolling his eyes as they talked about fucking later. Yeah. Well, what a weird turn of events <laughs> in that show where the wife is constantly like, I'm all horned up and ready to get down. Uh -huh. And the husband is like, you married the wrong guy. Yeah. I'm way too concerned with this gay fella upstairs. <laughs> I think that tells you all you need to know about Norman Fell's character in that, that show. <laughs> I gotta find out if this guy's gay or not. Rather than right. come down and pound you for a while. And have sex with my my wife who i have been with for decades <laughs> i'm looking to spice things up god's watching and i want to keep him entertained <laughs> And he's seen this old tired shit plenty of times. <laughs> All right. so, so the VP shows up at the hockey arena and goes to the locker room, played by character actor Raymond J. Barry. I only know him as the chief of police from The Ref. I know he's done a few other things, but that's the, the only role that comes to my mind. The role that I know him best from, aside from The Ref, is he plays Timothy Oliphant's dad in Justified. Okay. And he's a wonderful piece of shit in that show. <laughs> and, like, in Intentionally, but he plays a great asshole in that. He shows up and he's like, well, boys, uh, are you Democrats or Republicans? Uh, we're Canadian, sir. And he's like, ah, well, then I can wish you luck. Haha, <laughs> that's a little political humor you know it's hard for me to make up my mind who should win tonight on account of i'm a politician you drove the jam of a child molester get him out of here get him out of here <laughs> so um and finally the movie says oh by the way this is the stanley cup finals we have a couple of announcers chiming in yeah and these were the real announcers of the pittsburgh penguins i don't i didn't put their names there whatever you know i don't follow this stuff right right no reason i thought one of them might have been peter Hyams, quite frankly but <laughs> so we cut back to the old lady's house <laughs> mrs roper's house as it happens and <laughs> this zoot suit riot thug is like hey listen here's what you're gonna do you're gonna call this phone number she's like why this is my husband's phone number and he's like bingo bingo she has to read him a script that says, essentially, they will not hurt me as long as you do what I ask. There will be two new assistants showing up and two guards. You are going to take them to the vice president's box. The chef is like, what am I going to do? I must comply. I do not want my beautiful wife, Dorothy, a boy, or do to get killed. As soon as he hangs up, he turns around and there's Powers Booth with a couple of his, his boys. Uh -huh. And he's just like, hey, where? We're about to head upstairs. What do you say, Chef Boyardee? You mind if I skip the first name? Sure enough, Chef Boyardee is, is compromised. Yeah. And the security says, Andrew Boyardee, are these men with you? And he's like, oh, yes, of course. They are with me. Oh, why wouldn't they be with me? I'm not nervous. You're nervous. We get a quick shot of uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Two minutes to face off. Yeah, so he's taking his kids to their seats. The vice president and his guests are all toasting inside their fancy private box. As soon as we get the, the two minutes to face off announcement, Chef Andrew Boyardee opens the elevator. Is like, the dinner, she is already. All the kitchen staff gets sent home. That doesn't make any sense. They just, they just tell them, they're like, all right, people, that's it. Everybody out of here. 
Like, it's suddenly a crime scene. Well, I guess it's the security detail of like, hey, as soon as dinner is done, we're going to get everybody out of this kitchen so that there can be a fight here in a minute. Right. Chef Andrew Boyardee and his thugs get in the elevator and up they go. Yep. And so while the national anthem is sung, which I didn't think happened in hockey. The American national anthem. Book. Right. I was like, oh, they do that at hockey games? Okay, fair enough. I thought it was either the Russian or the Canadian one, quite frankly. Powers Booth and his boys show up and they shoot some dudes in the parking garage and on the elevator like the, the the guard that's got the key for the elevator he gets shot and then powers booth and his men enter this private box while the anthem is still going on and you see powers booth pause and put his hand on his chest but he's also kind of sneaking his hand into his you know breast pocket mm -hmm. he's got a gun in there yeah and meanwhile all of this is taking place as the anthem is being sung and then we see our zoot suit thug at the old lady's house and he just murders her yeah he shoots her in the head and then takes those fig newtons those terrible nasty fig newtons <laughs> which is the bigger crime bo i think you know the answer to that and it begins with an f and ends in ig newtons powers booth and his dudes also kill some guards up in this private box and they basically take over the box yeah it's like this hostage box suite now it, it's very much like that scene <laughs> from the godfather you know you're gonna hear me make a lot of comparisons to the godfather in the course of this discussion well how could you not Bo? <laughs> but it's it's kind of that scene where the uh, corleone family settles all their family business in one day but it's like like you get this wife is killed the bad guys take over all of it set to the backdrop of the anthem right and it's a pretty good sequence all things being equal like again this is one of those movies that feels like a movie and this is a movie thing that happens when they spray these bullets all over the hostage suite one guy gets shot and then there's another man tending to this dude's injuries and the guy tending to the injuries he yells out this man is hurt he needs a doctor and Powers Booth walks over to the injured guy, puts a gun up to his head, and shoots him. And he's like, eh, no, he doesn't, baby. <laughs> it's great. It's such a good introduction to that character of, like, what is the quickest solution to this problem? Oh, let's just murder him. And then Powers Booth shoots and kills Chef Andrew Boyardee. He has a great line here where when everybody's like, oh, my God, he killed the chef. He's like, well, it turns out his wife was recently deceased. He never would have wanted to live with with like that without a he also randomly just shoots a guy in the leg yeah shoots a dude in the leg just for funsies <laughs> one guy starts to like reach for a gun and he and power spooth aims his gun at him and says go ahead heroes get all the best funerals <laughs> the vice president is sitting in this chair he's not doing anything which is i guess what most vice presidents do <laughs> he looks up at powers booth and he says what do you want you heartless thug and powers booth says i want world peace and an end to bigotry and no more mini malls <laughs> look i know what you're thinking evaluate the situation calculate potential losses take appropriate action that's right baby i'm ex-military and i got a jaw that most men would kill for it is so nice to have have a wantonly murderous villain like this in a movie that we are covering like john lithgow <laughs> as good an actor as he is never got a chance to be just this crazy and murderous nah, only when he shot the female jet pilot that was as close as he got the vice president even is like that man you just killed his name is walter f frankincense and his wife been married for 12 years they have a little boy who's four years old and powers booth goes great I'll send him a cod. <laughs> <laughs> It's terrific. <laughs> so more thugs show up in the hostage booth and drunk Bono's there and his buddy from the car crash earlier, he's there. And this poor man's Anthony Edwards shows up to be our computer hacker working for the yeah. bad guy. So he starts hacking on a computer. Then we get some hockey footage. And then Jean-Claude Van Damme, he's just still hanging out in the stands with his kids. And he says, uh, listen up, son and daughter, I have work to do. Emily, stay with your brother. Do not get abducted no matter what happens. And then Emily... Emily takes out her hand stamp that she's been handing out here and there and she stamps her dad's hand and she says now you won't be by yourself also this may come back later in the movie i don't understand how he's not alone with a hand stamp but yeah john claude van damme hands over some money and he says here use this to buy non-alcoholic beverages unless you want some wine i'm okay with my kids drinking wine all right but get in small glass like the children's size glass i think you will know <laughs> it is not as big as the one you see me drinking 
home, but it is also, quite delicious. You know, our family has its own label. I will take you to their homeland one day. Do not leave your seats. And Tyler, my son, what is that in your jacket? Is that a Chekhov's brand mini size super soaker water gun? Oh, why are we drawing such attention to this prop? More importantly, why did you bring such a tiny but powerful water gun to a hockey game? Perhaps that will be important later in the movie as well. Okay, do not tell your mom that I left you alone for the majority of the movie. I mean the hockey game. And uh, I will see you kids later. Au revoir. Stay out of danger. And, and so he takes off and Tyler, all pissed off, says probably has to chase more light bulbs stupid dad <laughs> not being a firefighter anymore here we get to hear gary glitters rock and roll part two yeah being chanted as it does in most sports arenas <laughs> well it used to i think it's still played at hockey games are you sure because of all the pedophilia his role in spice girls got cut out because yeah he was into child pornography and having sex with underage kids yeah it's weird to hear it these days it's like seeing a woody allen movie where you're like oh right like watching anything with bill cosby in it and you're like ew it's not just don't meet your heroes it's don't learn anything about your heroes <laughs> ever 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 because it turns out that everybody is gross you jerk off for the lord so you're the exception it's how i pray chad <laughs> how dare you question my relationship with my lord <laughs> I'm not questioning anything. I'm, I'm supporting it. <laughs> you better. And um, <laughs> what, not what my last church said. You keep that in your pants. How dare you? Uh, so <laughs> the, the vice president is kind of grandstanding. He's like, there's no reason to kill anybody else. One guy is about to muscle the vice president. He's like, don't worry about it. He's just campaigning. Powers Booth here says, hey, baby, I may have to kill people if they disagree or object to anything that I'm trying to do. Hey, over there. Hey, make that cow stop moving mooing dude <laughs> reference to the mayor's wife <laughs> the mayor's wife crying because of all the violence that has occurred in front of her the the sheer trauma him saying and that's an actual line you better stop that cow from mooing <laughs> oh it's good <laughs> holy shit <laughs> There's dead bodies and just puddles of blood that are continually growing in size all around her. <laughs> and then we get the requisite explanation of what Powers Booth wants in this situation, mm. which is a pretty good scheme. It's it's basically saying, hey, the government has frozen all of these accounts for various reasons, totaling about $1.7 billion. That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. And I respect the fact that it is as much money as it is for this this whole scheme like it it is worth the trouble of the plan that they are trying to enact to get 1.7 billion dollars it's step level up from hijacking a plane in our last movie here they are committing multiple federal crimes man yes you are taking the vice president of the united states hostage <laughs> along with an entire arena full of people which is great and basically he says look baby what you're gonna do is you're gonna transfer one third of that 1.7 billion dollars to me at the end of each period or i will kill one person at the end of period one two people at the end of period two and if i don't have my money by the end of the third period the whole place goes up in a ball of fire baby the vice president says you're gonna blow up the whole stadium well that's gonna kill you too haha -ha, i've discovered a flaw in your plan check and as some more skilled players in the game of chess also say mate and one of the female hostages says i don't think any man with manicured fingernails and a ten thousand dollar wristwatch is planning on blowing himself up powers booth responds to that with i'm not sure if i like you or not lady but you're gonna be the first to find out he also points out it's a fifteen thousand dollar wristwatch baby dude he, uh, again it is so nice to have a good villain in a movie for once <laughs> powers booth to his credit completely hamming it up here oh, as yeah. you need to for a role like this secret service agent hallmark he's down in this security truck explaining to somebody on the phone how the one thing that they were there to do protect the vice president has indeed not been done he's on the phone and he says we've lost him but we'll find him the whole arena's on lockdown nobody can get in or out and then he hangs up and he goes like how the fuck did we lose the vice president <laughs> yeah i don't want to point out the obvious but you didn't lose him he's still up in the hostage suite watching the game is it a game or is it a match? Game? I think it's a game. Oh, yeah. Right. On the heels of this, we see a bunch of police show up and surround the stadium. A bunch of ambulances, too. I'm like, why are they sending ambulances? Hope for the best, prepare for the worst situation? 
Absolutely. I think they know where this is all headed. Uh, back up in the uh, vice president's booth. Also, hey, Bo, score is tied at one, and there's two minutes left in the first period. Yeah, that feels like the kind of excitement you can expect from hockey. This glasses nerdlinger thug confirms to Powers Booth, like, oh, it's the end of the first period, and guess what? No money's been moved. And Powers Booth says, boy, it's a real shame that no one believes you until you have to do something drastic. When the period ends, we can all agree that this mayor's wife has been the most annoying either that money starts flying or brains start flying get that cow up here we're gonna kill her next or first depends where you're gonna start counting from back in the seeds emily and tyler are ordering drinks and emily's doing a real like i want a coke no a pepsi i want a hamburger <laughs> no a cheeseburger <laughs> tyler is like our dad's too scared to be a real fireman emily go ahead and order your stupid sprite and then he squirts her in the face with his water gun uh -huh. and then she runs off all pissed off to look for her dad yeah. Talk about a shitty birthday for Tyler, right? He's just sitting all alone. Completely alone in the seats. Father not to be found. Sister pissed off at him. Could be having dinner with his mom and Michael, who, let's face it, not his dad, but not terrible. Not a bad guy. He could be eating wings. Honey barbecue. Maybe trying a, a super spicy. At the end of it, all the staff is going to come around and humiliate themselves by singing happy birthday <laughs> and clapping in time with one another. <laughs> It's time to celebrate your birthday. It happens every... Yeah. Back in the hostage suite. The computer hacker. He's still seeing no money being moved into their account. The mayor's wife, she's still sobbing because she knows what's kind of happened to her. Then we cut to the ladies' room in this hockey arena where Iceberg, the cartoon penguin, is suiting up for some shenanigans. And this female concession stand worker walks in and she says, Hey, Joni, going out to entertain the veep. Also, are you about six inches taller? And your stance its way more <laughs> menacing than it normally is and then the first period time runs down to zero so up in the hostage suite powers booth gleefully turns around shoots the mayor's wife mm -hmm. he is not playing around yeah sure enough the mooing has now stopped <laughs> emily runs down to this bathroom to clean up the coke or sprite or pepsi or whatever she spilled on her lap when her brother sprayed her with the squirt gun emily walks in to find iceberg the lovable mascot of the penguins walking around now emily knows that joan the friendly blonde who really wants to hook up with her dad Dad is inside the costume and emily says iceberg it's me your old pal emily and then the corpse of that female concession stand worker falls out of a bathroom stall face plants on the floor just leaving a puddle of blood emily who is eight starts shrieking yes <laughs> thus cementing today as the most memorable birthday her brother tyler has ever have or will ever have in emily's memory the day that emily has is is one of the top, I don't know, four shittiest days that anyone ever had ever. It kind of starts with her getting squirted and also maybe being forced to watch this hockey game. I, yeah, I think being forced to go to the hockey game is like, really? Ugh. Like, maybe I'll get a hot dog. That'll be the high point of the day. But then, seeing a dead body almost fall on you. She sees the dead body of a stranger just fall out of a women's bathroom stall and just crash onto the ground, leaving blood all over the tile floor. This stranger now in the icy uniform or she might still think it's joan in the icy uniform she doesn't know grabs her and is like if you scream i'm gonna find your mother and kill her <laughs> That's what she says. and emily's like oh my god what if emily had been like go ahead do it <laughs> like i hate her i hate her and michael who's michael <laughs> don't worry about it but kill him too if he's home a, a couple of other women come into the women's room and emily basically runs out uses this as a distraction and, and tries to get away what did she do with the dead body did iceberg the penguin just stuff it back into one of the stalls i think the women came in and just thought it was like somebody <laughs> drunk at the game out of the way diane i gotta take a wicked piss up. should we call somebody she's bleeding a lot should we call somebody? Are we gonna call somebody? I'm getting back to my seat. This is game seven, all right? Did that little girl get squirted with a word or gun? <laughs> it's my Pennsylvania impression. We see Jean-Claude Van Damme. He returns to check on his kids. Emily is gone and presumed abducted. And Tyler says, Emily ran off. She hit me. Then I sprayed her with this water gun. And Jean-Claude Van Damme says, I told you to not to move. For that, I cannot forgive you. Even on this, the day of your birth. I am taking the water gun. Perhaps we will 
use this later in the movie in a very lethal fashion. Um, how I have to be creative in how I repurpose it. And you, you don't move. Even if the building is falling around you, you do not move. Wait a minute. That is what happened when I killed that little girl at the start of the movie. When I was a firefighter. Come to think of it, if I had moved and left the building, which was falling down around me, then the little girl who haunts my sleep every night, she would still be alive. <laughs> but maybe this approach works for you, my son. Don't move your from your chair. So he takes off to look for Emily. There's a quick cutaway to the booth where Powers booth. <laughs> After murdering the mayor's wife and everybody's like weeping and trying to get control of themselves, uh -huh. he's like, this wine that I got, it's young, kind of precocious, and just hams it up while the vice president is like, I can't imagine a worse fate than the one you deserve. And he's like, whatever, baby. I'm getting my money and I'm having a glass of wine. Enjoy the good things. Am I right? Jean-Claude Van Damme. He's running around in a panic looking for his daughter. And he sees Emily with Iceberg the Penguin. And he follows them down into the kitchen that was closed up earlier in the movie. Iceberg walks over to this elevator with Emily. And there's a Secret Service agent there. And he says, sorry, sir. Park's closed. I mean, you don't have any clearance. And then Iceberg, this six and a half foot clown prince of ice skating penguin shenanigans says the owners just called i'm the team mascot we're here to see the vice president of the united states and i think this is his niece or something and the secret service agent he taps his ear and he says uh, uh randy do we have clearance for uh mr icy the penguin and a little girl who may be the owner's niece or something randy hello Randy, are you there? And then the penguin just pulls out a gun and shoots this secret service agent, but not before saying, Mr. Icy the penguin is a woman, jerk off. And I don't understand, first off, I don't know why they're calling him Mr. Icy rather than Iceberg, but... Mm -hmm. I don't understand why the woman who's in the penguin costume says this to the Secret Service agent before killing him. That Mr. Penguin is a woman? Is this just like Mr. Penguin's preferred pronouns? Yeah, just fighting sexism along with murder. You can do both things. <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme rushes in to this industrial-sized kitchen to see the elevator doors closing with the penguin mascot Iceberg, his daughter Emily, and a mostly dead Secret Service agent on the other side of the doors as they close in front of him headed up to the vice president suite the doors you know close on him and he looks for a way up and can't find one and etc etc the real action though chad takes place inside this elevator uh -huh. where mrs icy has the gun pulled on this little girl and is like boy you're a real pain in the tuchus she puts two bullets in the brain of the secret service agent right just to make sure he's really really dead then she points the gun at emily uh -huh. and pulls the trigger to shoot her her. Yeah, and just is out of bullets is the only thing that saves this little girl's life. What a day for Emily. <laughs> Right. First Stanley Cup playoff game. First time seeing a dead body in the bathroom. First time seeing someone murdered. A Secret Service agent. Mm -hmm. First time looking down the business end of a firearm. Kids grow up fast these days, Bo. I love how this movie does not give a shit about the welfare of children. <laughs> it is trying to murder them left and right. The woman in the penguin costume, she tells Emily, you owe me a Mother's Day card. I'm like, what? Because you saved her life, therefore her life now belongs to you? Because yeah you gave it back to her mom yeah she owes mrs icy a life debt like enemy mine <laughs> they get to the top and powers booth is like who is this little nugget this little girl was wandering around downstairs i think her dad's looking for her. well you better get back down there and look for a nervous father what's your name little girl it's emily van damme Mm, Emily, why don't you tell me your last name? Or maybe I should fill up your mouth with spiders the way my mom used to when I lied. What's your father's full name? Dude, he threatens to fill this girl's mouth with spiders. <laughs> I knew you would love that. Oh, did I ever. <laughs> Emily tells him, my daddy, he's a boss. He's the head fireman. He makes sure everybody's safe and he changes light bulbs and he accidentally killed a little girl two years ago in a fire and he's brave and he's gonna come looking for me and you're gonna be sorry. Hey, go find out what we can on this guy, this fire marshal, whatever. Uh, you know what? Realistically, he poses no threat to anybody in this room, but let's go track him down just in case. Mrs. Icy takes the elevator down and uh -huh. finds Jean-Claude Van Damme like trying to find a way up. There are he can't get up through the stairs and that kind of thing so when he hears the elevator door like ding open up he runs and finds who he thinks is joan uh -huh. but mrs icy says 
my name's not Joan. She got sick. I'm <laughs> Tina. Jean-Claude Van Damme notices the hat that Emily was wearing in the elevator. Then as he's going to retrieve the hat, he sees a reflection in the elevator of Mrs. Icy pulling a gun on him. Uh-huh. So he karate kicks her, sending the elevator key that she was holding, falling into a crack. So the key is now gone. And then we get kind of the best scene of the movie where Jean-Claude, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Not kind of, man. It's the greatest thing in this whole film. It's the only thing you remember from this movie. It's him and this mascot. Mascot penguin. Beating the shit out of each other and using every implement of destruction in the kitchen to hit and clobber each other. It's pretty great. First off. It should be noted that Jean-Claude Van Damme is beating up a woman in a penguin costume. Sure. He keeps punching the beak of this penguin (laughs) costume. At one point, Jean-Claude Van Damme's face gets put on a meat slicer, Uh which is turning for added suspense. They crash into pots and pans. They land on a hot stove. The penguin drags Jean-Claude Van Damme down a table full of cut vegetables like it's a bar in a saloon fight. Mm -hmm. He pushes the penguin's hand hand into a deep fryer and i noted in the introduction that this movie was written to be a parody like the guy who wrote the screenplay for this i don't know if i mentioned this in the intro that he also wrote national lampoon's loaded weapon one and i think this was really meant to be a goof on die hard And this whole sequence plays out like that. It is laughably insane, all of the nonsense that happens. Like when the ventilation fan shreds one of the eyeballs off the penguin's costume's head. It's absurd, but it's kind of what you want out of a movie like this. The penguin grabs a meat tenderizer hammer to beat Jean-Claude Van Damme, and then he combats that with a full-size container of chili powder that he just squirts into the beak of this costume Mm -hmm. (laughs) the finale is that jean-claude van damme pushes this penguin through an industrial sized hobart dishwasher which either cooks her or chokes her or both but regardless it's all pretty good the movie does not explain how jean-claude van damme knows martial arts which he surprisingly does not use very much in this movie he just kind of punches and kicks that's never explained either no you know it's like oh jean-claude van damme what what did you expect right it's it it is that era where everybody seemingly knew karate to some extent where's tyler during all this bow just hanging out in his seat we get a (laughs) cutaway to him of him just being like hello is ever anybody coming back <laughs> happy birthday kiddo <laughs> right enjoy watching the game alone <laughs> and jean-claude van damme runs to tell a guard about his missing daughter who turns out to be one of the thugs yeah he's that drunk bono yeah he's like oh you must call the police my daughter she is missing and i was attacked by a six foot cartoon penguin drunk bono says oh, right away sir show me where this happened then we cut over to secret service agent hallmark who calls up Powers Booth in the hostage suite, and Hallmark says, put the vice president on the phone. Wait, is it? Hold on. It is a, as we will later learn, this is all just staged for, I guess, the benefit of everybody listening in. Okay. Because it's Hallmark saying, Look, you know, put the vice president on the phone. Let me make sure he's safe. I bet you sound like a company man. Where do you come from, stranger? Guy that I am certainly not working with. Listen up, baby. I'm a disillusioned patriot with a yearning to fulfill my personal ambitions what you want to know how many people up here are dead including secret service agents let me see four seven nine twelve carry the one hey it's a lot baby right now the mayor's wife is the only corpse still in here with us so look give me all the money i've asked for by the end of the game or i'm gonna blow up the stadium tango tango bye bye for now After that little stage conversation, Jean-Claude Van Damme takes this drunk Bono to the dish room, but now the body is gone. He's like, oh, well, I guess uh, we just need to find your daughter, Carla, was it? Jean-Claude Van Damme goes, what? And he goes, oh, that's how I always fuck this up on account of how drunk I am. But I always screw up by thinking that you never told me the name of the little girl or whatever. And so it just reveals him to be a bad guy and they fight some more. Is is it 
like a block of ice or something that Jean Claude Van Damme is pressing this guy's face into. No, it's like a flat top grill because he's oh, okay. burning it off. But I just want to pause for a moment. In my notes, I had that drunk Bono said, "Your daughter's name's Carla, right?" And then Jean Claude Van Damme gives it a "What the fuck? How mm-hmm. do you know my daughter's name?" But his daughter's name isn't Carla. His daughter's name is emily right carla is actually the name of the woman in the penguin costume what got killed early okay because yeah i just i never put that together i didn't know what the hell was going on so in the reality of this movie this security guard is like well paid your daughter what did you say her name was carla and he's just like fuck you i'm gonna beat the shit out of you the guy didn't know his daughter's name yeah i know I, it makes no sense. So he burns his head on the side of the grill like two or three times. And then finally the guy just gives it up. He's like, oh, your daughter's upstairs with the vice president. And we've got a bunch of bombs all over the stadium. We're going to blow this place up if we don't get all of our money. Owie, ow, 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 The guy gets free and starts to attack Jean-Claude Van Damme again. Uh-huh. Who then takes a chicken bone. That's a beef bone. It's like something out of the Flintstones, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's a, or a brontosaurus burger bone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah snaps it in half it's like a bovine face kills this guy by stabbing him in the neck with a half broken bone yeah that's all right and so jean-claude van damme then goes to the nearest public phone is like hello hello but all the phone lines are down and so he goes to search for uh through some uh, executive offices where he finds dead joan and in true diehard fashion he finds a radio that he can then use to call 911 and the 911 operator is like, oh, yeah, uh, the whole civic arena being taken over by terrorists. Yeah, we know about that. Listen, um, you're going to well, wait in those offices for about 90 seconds and we're going to give you a ring back, okay? He hangs up. Hallmark then calls him and says, we understand the situation. We know what's going on. Where are you? We need you to stay put. Someone is taking over the owner's box with the vice president of the American United States. They also have the apple of my eye, my daughter, Emily. And I think maybe my son is still watching the hockey game or something. He is kind of a simpleton. No? I have killed two terrorists. One of them was in a penguin costume. One of them I st- stabbed in the neck with a broken cow female. They are going to blow up the stadium. They want money. You must give it to them. If my daughter dies, my ex-wife is going to be so pissed off. This will be the second little girl I will be responsible for killing in my lifetime. I can handle one, but I now <laughs> cannot handle two. So Hallmark is like, be cool, baby. All, we're going to do this by the numbers. Don't worry about anything. We got it handled. And as he's saying this, a bunch of cars explode in the parking lot. It's setting bystanders on fire. They're yeah. running around screaming and covered in flames. <laughs> and it also is a nice reminder that this is a movie that could not happen today in a world of cell phones because no. everybody in the arena would know what was up as soon as there were explosions in the parking lot. As, as soon as 50 police cars and 20 ambulances yeah. showed up outside, everyone inside would know what was going on. So Jean-Claude Van Damme is like, if you will not uh, t- take care of this problem, I will do it myself. I will find all of these bombs and I will save the day. And Hallmark <laughs> says look you can't do anything alone and Jean-Claude Van Damme looks at his hand and says but I have the stamp I am not alone I didn't put any of that together that that's what he did there <laughs> yeah there's a, there's a quick cutaway to Powers Booth up in the box with the vice president where the vice president is asking him how long were you in the service and he says I still am baby also How'd you like seeing all those cars blow up? Pretty cool, am I right? Jean-Claude Van Damme is rummaging through a desk in these executive offices of the Penguins, and he finds some Zippo lighter fluid and a Bic lighter, and he takes that, and he's got this radio because we're in a diehard knockoff, and off he goes. Outside helicopters start to hover above the arena, and they deploy a SWAT team members down on these cables to the roof of the arena itself, and then across the way, the Zoot Suit henchman, he's looking on, and he just fires a rocket at the helicopter helicopter which explodes and the SWAT team members fall to the ground crashing on top of those cars that just blew up. I like the kind of cat and mouse of all right we're gonna try to sneak in by some helicopters oh shit you blew those up okay well let's recalibrate and try to figure out another way to save the day. Powers Booth meanwhile calls Hallmark and says Hey, baby, I think I remember distinctly telling you about a no helicopters rule. I'm just sitting back enjoying some shrimp cocktail. 
jail while you are picking up the charred remains of your police friends. And so Hallmark then orders all the other helicopters to land. Like, we're going to ground all the helicopters. By the way, go up to that building where we think the rocket came from and see if we can find the guy who fired this. He may know something about all this. <laughs> right. <laughs> By the time they get up there, all that remains is a cup of warm coffee. And some Fig Newton crumbs. Right. Oh my God. Look at this. This guy's a monster. We're dealing with a maniac. <laughs> yeah. C kind of deviant sits up here and eats Fig Newtons and blows up helicopters. <laughs> we get more hockey footage. Game's tied at two. 11 minutes left in period two. Tyler's just drinking a coat, spending his birthday alone again jean-claude van damme he runs up to check on his boy and he sees a couple of rough looking dudes walking up the steps um who honestly just look like a couple of hockey fans on their way to the <laughs> bathroom but then jean-claude van damme he runs off and hides then we cut to powers booth who's now taken up smoking while the computer hacker is monitoring all the security cameras in their arena as he awaits money to be transferred into their bank account right and they watch as some guys are trying to infiltrate the arena powers booth kind of gets on the horn and tells the rest of his crew like hey we got a couple of knuckleheads sneaking in to try to undo our plot take care of them put them on ice baby and then outside the arena a zamboni comes rolling down the steps and crashes into a bunch of cop cars and then there's a dead guy maybe strapped into the driver's seat yeah. And then it opens up and ice pours out filled with all of the dead guys that were killed in the initial ambush up in the vice president suite. And Hallmark shows up and he's like, Jesus Christ, get him out of here. There's a kind of a cut between two scenes as both Hallmark and Powers Booth are pulling up information on their computer screens on Jean-Claude Van Damme and realizing like, oh, this guy, it's the diehard scene of, oh, it turns out this guy is a cop from New York or in this case a fire marshal from pittsburgh <laughs> yeah and powers boo <laughs> says this guy could be a real pain in the ass on account of having heroic tendencies we need to take him out meanwhile our guy with heroic tendencies is having a good old-fashioned freak out in the bathroom of this place he just chunks his radio at the mirror in the bathroom which makes it shatter yeah and then there's some guy who is wrapping up a shit he walks <laughs> out and pats jean-claude van damme on the back and says hey don't get so worked up you know the penguins they're gonna win all right see you later pal now nah, i don't wash my hands either as a bunch of these thugs are looking for john claude van damme he is in like some sub basement or whatever well that's what you do in a diehard movie bo you run around the steam tunnels and so he finds his first bomb and he starts to disarm it while powers booth is on the horn with hallmark saying listen you guys are a little bit behind you should have had some money in my bank account at the end of the second period and you have now killed two productive members of society and so the period ends and powers booth kills the mayor and then decides he's gonna trigger a bomb yeah why would he do that that seems like that would really give away turns out it doesn't work it was really just a lighter that he had which like this is another crack in the armor of powers booth uh in terms of finding out who's behind this uh -huh. because what all you have to do is go to custom lighter manufacturers in the greater greater pittsburgh area uh -huh. and see who says I would like a lighter in the shape of a detonator. Sure enough, nothing explodes and the computer guy gives him the real trigger to set off bombs, but he doesn't really set anything off. During this, we do get some real suspense as we see Jean-Claude Van Damme disarming the first bomb, which he knows how to disarm bombs now? I think he's just guessing. It's two wires and I guess he's like, well, I have a 50% chance of getting this right. <laughs> if not, we all go to hell together. I either disarm it or it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. And then the movie cuts outside and we see a bunch of fireworks exploding at the moment you think that the bomb might be going off. I think it's supposed to be a little bit of a head fake. I didn't understand why they would be shooting fireworks outside the arena at the end of period two because no one in the arena can see the fireworks. It's a closed dome. Uh, it's a good question. I don't have an answer for you. The math doesn't quite add up there. But yeah, so Jean-Claude Van Damme does have a kind of a clever idea of, well, I can't communicate with the team outside. So 
also I'm going to use the sign outside in the parking lot and tell all the agents like, oh, the building is rigged with C4 and I'm going to try to disarm all of them. He also types, happy B-Day, Tyler. Don't leave your seat. <laughs> right. I hope you enjoyed those fireworks, Tyler. Love your dad. And then Zoot Suit Bad Guy, who's across the way, he's got another rocket launcher. He fires it at the Jumbotron and blows that up so that Jean-Claude Van Damme can't send out any more updates or birthday wishes. That explodes. The third period officially begins. Tyler's just watching the game, bored, mm -hmm. all alone, wishing he was at BW3 with Mom and Michael. Michael gave him a sip of beer once. Michael's an alcoholic, by the way. Look, nobody's second marriage is the best marriage. It's just <laughs> where the, the shores that you wash up on. Uh, Hallmark, <laughs> meanwhile, says, hey, I'm going to go into the Civic Arena. And they're like, that's crazy talk. You could be killed. He says really strangely, well, if I die, tell my ex-wife the gravy train went off the tracks. This movie does not have a glowing uh, look at marriage, to be sure. You think if he real, because he does die in a moment. Yeah. And do you think that that special agent went to his ex-wife's house? Mrs. X Hallmark. Yes, that's me. I have some unfortunate news. Your, your ex-husband, Dave Hallmark, he died last night in that incident at the, the Penguins game. Oh my God. Oh my God. Well, he knew that he was in danger and he wanted me to give you a final <laughs> message. What was it? <laughs> he said, well, would you like me to paraphrase or no, give you no, the... Please. Please just tell me exactly what did he say word for word. I know we had our differences and, and we were estranged, but but we were working on things. There was a chance we might get back to what what did, what did my dear Dave Hallmark, what were his, his departing words that he wanted you to tell me? Well, it began, <laughs> tell my ex-wife. That's me, yes. The gravy train has gone off the tracks. Fuck him! <laughs> wait, wait, there's more. <laughs> he said, you can tell that overweight harpy <laughs> that she doesn't have the eyes of her ex-husband to pluck from his skull <laughs> day in and day out like some kind of greek myth that the biggest mistake that i i ever made you understand these are his words not mine the biggest mistake i ever made was agreeing to a second date <laughs> with that terrible terrible example of human <laughs> of a human being and then on the back, hold on, I got to flip this over. <laughs> so Jean-Claude Van Damme is wandering around this building just looking for uh, bombs to disarm. Then decides to detour to A-Team Country by rigging up this crazy plastic tube with a nail at the end of it that runs up his arm. Yeah, he puts a nail inside the cap you put on top of electrical wires. Uh -huh. And then there's a plastic tube that connects to some sort of air compressor. Sir, it's some real low-grade MacGyver hijinks. He finds uh, some ripped open stuffed penguins right next to another bomb that he disarms. This is when uh, he gets found by one of the other thugs in the building. And he tries to threaten him by saying, Do you see this? This is C4, the most powerful explosive in all of the world. And the guard says, I know better than that. You have to have a detonator for that to work. And he's like, oh, you are very clever. But did you know I made my own? sleeve gun and then he fires this <laughs> nail thing into the guy's neck and at most it would have broken the skin bow it's not going to kill the guy <laughs> he hit him with a high powered nail I and mean, the guy was like ow why did you do that this really stings but it kills the guy and then another thug shows up right behind him he says Wait, before you shoot me, look, I've got C4. This is the most powerful explosive. <laughs> but before he can get it out of his mouth, Hallmark shows up and knocks this guy out. And Jean-Claude Van Damme says, wait a second, do you believe me about this C4? Hallmark is like, I'm afraid not. <laughs> he introduces himself. He's like, my name is Hallmark. I'm the guy that you were talking to outside. And Jean-Claude Van Damme just punches this guy in the face. Uh -huh. And he's like, that is for putting the life of my children in danger. All right, now we are friends again. Let me show you something see this this is a bomb there are many more like it all over the arena i have drawn this picture where i would put all of the bombs if i was going to blow up this place i realize that makes me look incredibly guilty that i have a map of where all the bombs are yeah but trust me i did not set the bombs i am on your side i am a good guy wait a minute why is your eye twitching when i call you good guy you look kind of suspicious yourself but don't let that stop me from telling you i have but a son he is watching the game 
He is in seat D10. No, that is not Mighty Ducks number 10. That is his seat number. Oh, Mark says, look, the third period just started. We have less than 20 minutes to end this movie. And Jean-Claude Van Damme reassures Hallmark by saying, let's hope I know what I am doing. Okay. And I'm like, that's not reassuring at all. <laughs> right. The fact that you drew some crazy treasure map for yourself and are using <laughs> that to save everyone's lives. That's sketchy at best. But sure enough, some guys show up with machine guns. When did he draw this map, though? Did he just sit down like, all right, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know this building like the back of your head. Plus, you have a PhD in structural engineering. Where would you put the bombs? Right, I would put one here. Okay. <laughs> I would put one here. Um, okay. What else would they put one? Oh, here. Definitely put one here. <laughs> I have thought about blowing things up a lot. And this is, I, this building in particular, I have been thinking of blowing up for some time now. Maybe he drew it months ago. Like, <laughs> Right. Like, this is an early draft of his own personal Unabomber manifesto. If I don't get to my Perez this year, everything is going to come down. They will call me the fireman for many different reasons. We get another cutaway to the booth with Powers Booth and the vice president, where the vice president is like, you know, you're never going to get all that money because they'll trace it. And, you know, anywhere that you try to spend it or you try to move it, they'll find it. And Powers Booth is like, that's the great thing about technology, baby. I'm going to route and reroute this movie so many times. You guys aren't going to know which end is up. By the time it's all said and done, I'm going to net a cool half a billion dollars at least. You might get some of the money, but you ain't ever going to get all of it. It's a more modest take than the 1.7 billion dollars but all things being equal 500 million dollars still a lot of money powers booth gets a call here from some mystery person and he says hey baby not on the phone you know they got the frequency by now i'll come down and meet you later and you're like who could this be bo who could this be right and so sure enough hallmark shows up and meets powers booth revealing himself to be what? in on the plan <laughs> and he tells Powers Booth like oh this guy Jean-Claude Van Damme is on the hunt for all these bombs and Powers Booth is like I'll tell you what why don't you go get that shitty kid of his bring him up we'll make sure that this guy ceases to be an issue which doesn't happen by the way right. well it's the next scene where Hallmark goes to this kid Tyler is like hey pal buddy little little buckaroo how about you come with me your dad sent me to bring you up to the owner's box my dad said to stay here even if the building fell down plus there's only 16 minutes left in the game i'm gonna stay here also my dad kind of sucks and you suck if you're his friend he's like come on kid 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 come on kid hey you know what i'm a secret service agent all right let you know a little secret all right i'll be your best friend come on i'll give you five dollars come on kid's like shut up you suck. Look, uh, I'm, a, I'm a friend of your dad's. He invited me to dinner tomorrow night with your mom. Yeah, that's unlikely because my dad and mom are divorced. She married Michael. He was a real cuck who works at middle management and insurance company. He said he gave me some beer one time. I drink his beer all the time. I put it in my super circle and I squirt it in my mouth at school. I have a Drew Barrymore level alcohol problem at a young age. Don't look under my seat. It's going to be full of a bunch of little tiny bottles of wine that this jackass sold to me because my dad said it was okay if i get drunk at the hockey game happy birthday to me Woohoo! <laughs> I, I know those birthdays <laughs> anyway jean-claude van damme is off to disarm another bomb and hallmark shows back up because he couldn't get this kid out of his seat uh sure enough hallmark finally pulls a gun on him he's like huh? but you, i thought you were a good guy <laughs> I haven't called you a good guy, and now you have made me look like a fool. The Hallmark says, all right, turn out your pockets. Let's see what you're holding on to. Jean-Claude Van Damme shows that all he's got is this water gun and a lighter. And he's like, what are you going to do with that? Squirt me? And then Jean-Claude Van Damme says, well, sort of. How do you like a little hot under the collar action? Flambe? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> And so it turns out that he filled this water gun with the lighter fluid he found in the offices and sets Hallmark on fire. Is that a pretty big leap for certain people of the movie going audience to realize that he took the Zippo lighter fluid, put it in the gun, sprayed it, set it on fire, and then that's how this guy gets killed? Because it just seems like a quick shot of him putting the lighter fluid in there. Does that ruin the surprise? I don't think it ruins the surprise, but it's just a scene you don't need. Like, I feel like you know he's got this lighter fluid and 
when he, you know, squirts the guy and he catches fire. Maybe for some dum-dums in the audience, but I think for most of the movie-going public, they would put okay. two and two together here. He ends up running into some access tunnel away from the burning Hallmark, who somehow manages to not only catch up to him, but get ahead of him? Because he jumps up for one more scare like he's Jason Voorhees. Uh, well, he's all melted and crusty, and you know it had to stink. Oh, There's yeah. no way he could have snuck up on him smelling that bad. Well, you burn that much hair and flesh and whatever his suit was made of? They say, though, that human flesh smells like pork when it's cooking. Ooh, who says that? People who know these things. Who? The Nazis. People that run crematoriums? Yeah, no, there's a, there's an old slang term for it. Like, people are called long pork. Who calls them that? <laughs> Cannibals, mostly. But they're, no, like, this is, this is a what fact. What are we having for dinner tonight? Long pork. Uh-huh. I gotcha. Yeah. It's the other, other, other white meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, my brain is a sieve for, it catches that kind <laughs> of, of trivia. Like, I don't remember algebra or any of that, but you ask me what human flesh tastes like. That's a thing that I held on to where I was like, oh, really? Human flesh tastes like pork? Great. That's something I'll probably <laughs> need to use one day if I ever have a podcast. Jean-Claude Van Damme. He picks up the phone belonging to Hallmark, which is not melted, and and he calls the last number that's in there and Powers Booth answers. He's like, hey, ring a ding ding. It's me, Powers Booth, baby. Jean-Claude Van Damme says, Hallmark is dead. It is I, um, Tom Costillo, <laughs> secret service agent extraordinaire at your service. Hey, let me talk to one of the hostages, preferably one under the age of nine. So Powers Booth puts Emily on the phone and Jean-Claude Van Damme says, oh, Emily, it is I, your father. I pretended to be Tom Costillo, secret service agent extraordinaire. Do not tell Powers Booth who you're talking to. He thinks I am somebody else. It's like on the Jerky Boy CDs that your brother lets you listen to. Look around. Tell me, how many people are there that are still alive? And Emily says, three, four, eight, nine, twelve? Because she doesn't know how to count. Yeah. And Powers Booth snatches the phone from her and he says, hey, baby, what's going on here? And Jean-Claude Van Damme says, ha ha, it is me, Jean-Claude Van Damme. You have been fallen victim to my sneaky plans. You touch the little girl and you make cross eyes for anything and I'll kill you. I like the fact that when Jean-Claude Van Damme tries to use this Tom Castillo name, uh -huh. Powers Booth immediately knows this is all bullshit because uh -huh. he's like, I know who's out there. Like, listen, baby, it's you, Jean-Claude Van Damme. But yeah, he says like, look, baby, I know that you're Jean-Claude Van Damme, and I know that you know that I know that you're Jean-Claude Van Damme. So how about we cut the shit? I'm gonna kill your daughter if you don't knock off the shit. And Jean-Claude Van Damme is like, oh, ho, ho. I have an idea for another game. Would you like to know the rules? I love playing games. Hit me with your best shot. First of all, if you hurt my little girl, the game is off and I will kill you. Okay. The other rules are, I'm going to try to stop you by disarming all of these bombs. If I win, then none of the bombs go off. Off and then you get caught but if i do not get all of the bombs then you get away with all this all this murder and mayhem and all of the money how about that for a game it is basically uh, the same thing that you are going to do anyway <laughs> yeah whatever you say baby you're just in my world and you're living in it sure if you want to feel like you came up with the idea run with that and there's a whole thing where power spooth is like hey baby you know what an aop is and he's like you know i'm going to ignore that because i really don't care <laughs> AOP is an assault on principle. In this case, it's the vice president or whatever. And then he, they, when they hang up, Powers Booth says to Emily, Hey, you want a cigarette or a glass of wine? That's customary before you die. And I'm definitely going to kill you, little girl. Emily looks back at him and she says, Could, um, could I have one of those Chesterfields now? You got a match? You, d don't bother. I got one. You know, I read a lot. <laughs> uh, especially things that have to do with history. I find that shit fascinating. And here's a fact, and I don't know if you know this or not, but Sicilians were spawned by, hey, 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 baby, stop this little girl right now. <laughs> Look. Maybe QT can get away with that kind of dialogue, but not in <laughs> sudden death, baby. She does say, like, you're a big meanie head, mean face. Hey, you, you ever wonder how I got that way? I don't know. Maybe your brain's broken or something. All I know is if there were people like you in my school, they'd be expelled. And he goes, yeah, 
There are one or two like me in your school. Don't even worry about it, baby. And she stamps his hand at that point. Uh Uh, So that'll pay off at the end. But this, Chad, leads to a theory I have about this movie, the subtext of which being that Powers Booth is gay. I think the movie doesn't put too fine a point on that, but there are a number of points. And also, I think just Powers Booth's performance in general kind of lends credence to the idea that he is playing this character as if not closeted than at least being kind of gay. Huh. I don't I, I don't think it matters in the grand scheme of the thing. I think it's just an actor choice, but I really like it. That wasn't my read on it. I think he was just waxing nostalgic on the fact that there are crazy people everywhere. Just some of them have the balls to act on that kind of craziness. But I think it's in, like, not just that scene, but it's sort of the flamboyance in general with the character, as well as, like, the manicured nails and the fact that he's very particular about his clothes and the watch he's wearing. There are a number of, like, little clues that I think add up. It doesn't matter. I think that that theory holds up in the context of... Of when this movie was made. I Like if I were doing an English paper. I could provide enough evidence. For a B minus. Oh Chad let's be real. B plus. I'm a good writer. <laughs> B plus at bare minimum. <laughs> but yeah. So it like I said. Don't matter to nothing. But I think it's kind of interesting. And it's interesting that this movie has enough little stuff like that. That you could kind of interpret something yeah. from the movie. Anyway. But so John claude Van Damme is off hunting bombs again. There's more hockey. We get to see Taylor still watching the game by himself and then there's some chatter that calls back to a throwaway line earlier about how the penguins goalie is playing with a 104 degree fever Mm -hmm. which means this man would be suffering from brain damage right now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> the goalie calls over to the ref and he's like i don't feel so goody and then the goalie leaves the game much to the disapproval of his coach and this goalie who i'm sure was somebody goes into the locker room jean-claude van damme gets a call from powers booth who says hey fireman you don't call you don't write how many bombs have you found i could blow them up right now and find out and then we hear the sounds all around jean-claude van damme and so powers booth knows that he's at like bomb number seven because of the high volume of the crowd cheering behind him yeah powers booth radios to his guys and is like he's at number seven go get him john claude van damme emerges from the stands and is immediately chased by some goons yeah and rather than run down the stairs he runs down the full seats just stepping on people and bounding over them till he gets down to the ice where he smacks into the glass around the rink itself and i know noted this in the introduction and if i'm feeling ambitious i'll post some of this online though there are scenes of this movie where they've got these cardboard cutouts of people in the crowd <laughs> did you see this not until you put that in the introduction did i even notice but now it's like oh well that's all you can see and it's like the same 12 people yeah just peppered in there it looks like you're watching an assembly at south park elementary or something i love it because it's it's such clever bad filmmaking i like this kind of it, the same way i like dummies being thrown out of trains and right. models being used and stuff like that i really I, I i love it when you can see the magic behind the movie it's really good so jean-claude van damme he runs away with these two bad guy thugs chasing after him jean-claude van damme he runs into the penguins locker room to make his getaway and here he sees the goalie passed out suffering from swelling of the brain with <laughs> beads of sweat the size of grapes pouring off his body We then cut to a shot of that exact same goalie now not wearing his hockey uniform laying on a table wearing an oxygen mask wait what yeah cut to jean-claude van damme wearing the goalie's uniform skating back onto the ice as the penguins crowd goes wild Bo, not since the emergence of enrico palazzo at dodger stadium in the naked gun (laughs) has a complete idiot usurped the identity of a public figure at a sporting event all right so this is both wonderful and wonderfully stupid all at once what is he doing in theory he should be racing against the clock to defuse bombs 
times. Correct. Instead, he has assumed the identity of this goalie and is just going to have his shot at the bigs. That's not even part of his character or his backstory. Right. I mean, other than the fact that he once was a goalie one time, that is the only reference. Like, there's not some wistful like, oh, I just could not make it in the big leagues. They said I was not good enough and I had to become a firefighter instead. There's none of that, but sure enough. How did we downshift from diehard knockoff into the world of invincible or Rudy territory? Right, slap shot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy because the, the next five minutes of the movie turns into a sports drama where this guy is thrust into this position where he is playing goalie. Like he gets to the box and the coach is like, feeling better than get out there and be the goalie. Yeah, no one looks at his face and is like, who the hell are you? Right. He, he's not wearing a mask. You can see who he is. So he is sent to the goalie box. There's, you know, some business about him almost like letting a score through but then he makes this great save where even the announcers are like that's the save of this guy's career why it's almost like he's a different person like he's some kind of hero firefighter just dressed up as a goalie and then Jean-Claude Van Damme looks up into the crowd where his son is watching this hockey game by himself and he does the I love you sign language and points up toward his son mm -hmm. you know the one of his two children who didn't teach him this <laughs> phrase <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's real bad and the kid sees it and he goes that's my dad meanwhile his sister is sitting at gunpoint talking about no 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 it's history it's a fact it's <laughs> written <laughs> sure enough jean-claude van damme notices there's only four minutes left uh, in the game and is like oh i must go defuse the bombs and quit playing hockey so to get himself ejected from the game he just grabs the nearest chicago player and punches him in the face right and so the refs kick him out and the coach from the sidelines is screaming like that's a thousand dollar fine what are you doing but unlike the teammates of this guy the goons that were chasing him seem to recognize that this is him pretty quick Right, because they looked at his face. So they chase him <laughs> into the locker room where Jean-Claude Van Damme knocks one of them out with a hockey stick. After this guy shoots the equipment manager, I guess, Jean-Claude Van Damme ends up having to like cut his laces to get his skates off. And it's a real misfire that this movie does not have somebody being murdered by ice skates. Yeah, and they set that up too, because you see ice skates getting sharpened multiple times. Yeah. But that doesn't play out. Also, how long would it take him to suit up to go play? hockey like 30 minutes because it takes him about 10 minutes to get this stuff off right there's four minutes left in the game and it takes him <laughs> at least half of that to get back into like oh i better get back into my firefighter hero clothes white t-shirt tight black pants like okay this is a ensemble more suitable for an action hero also i now have an uzi yeah the second goon finds jean-claude van damme he's in a weight room and we have a machine gun shootout blowing up all the mirrors on the wall and then we get more hockey footage and we see that there's a minute and a half left in the game You're like yes this movie's almost over and then jean-claude van damme and the bad guy they're both out of bullets so they decide to just beat each other up with locker room equipment it's a repeat of the kitchen fight but without the penguin costume and in a weight room yeah jean-claude van damme just ends up knocking this guy out with some weight or whatever and so as the game is winding down powers booth is in the vp box just fondling his explosives uh -huh. or the trigger for the explosives as the time is winding down then the game ends as jean-claude van damme like fights this dude inside the the locker room and ends up stabbing him with some kind of machine and it's something that you would only recognize if you worked in the equipment room at a hockey <laughs> arena <laughs> right like, i have no idea what this thing is or does but it yeah, this is the d knocker you use this to go in and it holds in the studs that are used for the temporary placement for the skates then you come in you put in the actual r bolts and then that's how it's able to stabilize itself <laughs> Right. Oh, okay. Sure enough, a last minute score sends the game into overtime, aka sudden death. Powers Boo says, Well, I guess everyone's got a little more time, ring a ding ding. And you're like, Oh shit, there's more to this movie. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Because everybody's got time to take a breath, Jean-Claude Van Damme uses this time to mix up some kind of half ass bomb in a jar. It's more of this MacGyver nonsense. He's squirting in liquids and laundry detergent and some baking soda. And he rushes out and he starts to climb the outside of the arena like Adam West in old school Batman. Mm -hmm. So then we get more hockey footage because, Bo, this is Sudden Death, which is the name of the movie. Oh. And our announcers explain to us that the first one to score wins, which that seems to make sense to me. While Jean-Claude Van Damme is climbing the place like the Adam West Batman, he ends up seeing a guard pacing along these girders. It's a henchman. Yeah, it's not like a good guy. It's a bad guy. Yeah. yeah. And so he ends up having to do this like hand over hand climb along the side of it. And they scuffle for a minute and he ends up knocking the guy off the roof. Powers Booth pulls a gun on the vice president while his computer guy plays Doom in a scene that I don't understand the point of, but I liked everything that was happening in it. Sure enough, there's not one, but two thugs on the roof. Uh-oh. And so Jean-Claude Van Damme has to fight that guy while he's working his MacGyver magic on some wires to open the roof of the Civic Center. Yeah, it slowly opens up, revealing the freezing Pittsburgh night sky above this crowd that looks on below. Seems like that would cause a few heads to turn, but but not really. Nobody gets excited until at the end of this fight that Jean-Claude Van Damme has with this dude, Jean-Claude Van Damme ends up pulling the guy off of the roof and lets him go sailing down and strikes the scoreboard, which explodes like the natural. Yeah. And finally, everybody is like, oh my God, there may have been criminal activity going on in, uh, <laughs> in the Civic Center. The sparks explode everywhere. And you're right. It's the natural, but on ice. Yeah. Which was the worst Ice Capades adaptation ever. <laughs> Yeah. And so Jean-Claude Van Damme then ties a line to his gut, swings down onto some scaffolding, hooks his jar of dirt and lighter fluid to his belt. <laughs> C4 and Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> it swings down to the private boxes where he throws this jar bomb. Uh-huh. To blow a hole into the roof of the private box as he swings down and falls into this hole, knocking out one of the thugs and then just starts willy nilly murdering everyone who is standing up in this place. Could he be charged with attempted assassination of the vice president? Because he knew he was in there when he threw that bomb. Well, and also when he just starts spraying bullets everywhere, it's not like he's being real discriminate at this point either. So yeah, to the answer to your question, Chad, is yes. He absolutely could and should be tried. Down below, all of the hockey fans, they finally freak out and start running for the exits. And then the hockey players, they leave the ice. Okay, who wins this NHL final? Is it a draw? They're going to have to share the Stanley Cup? You get it Monday, Wednesday, Friday? We get it Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, every other Sunday? What are we doing here, people? I think they're just going to have to replay this sudden death thing like hey in two weeks we're gonna bring everybody back and you're just gonna play until somebody scores well, wait till they find out the goalie wasn't even in the game earlier to save that <laughs> right <laughs> yeah the, like the if this were a trial it would be thrown out the whole thing's gonna have to be a do-over yeah tyler doesn't leave his seat he sits there this kid is glued down as everybody in the stadium goes screaming out in a panic up in the hostage suite jean-claude van damme he is finally reunited with his daughter emily powers booth just sneaks out the back door the vice president isn't dead and there may be like two or three other hostages still alive as the fans in the arena run out in a panic outside of this place is a major police force and tyler is the only one left sitting in the arena by himself powers booth then takes off his expensive watch and bo he puts on this fake ned flanders halloween mustache <laughs> that is just beautiful yeah as his disguise to get away it's pretty good while he is adopting this disguise he also still has his trigger for the bombs yeah the remaining ones that weren't disarmed right and he says oh let's see how many you got jean-claude van damme and so he tries to set them all off but i think only one really goes off but it blows up some water line that spills yeah. water into the arena so people go splish splashing everywhere and kind of washed out the front door really <laughs> we yeah, I mean, I'm sure it was dangerous, but it looked kind of fun. And Jean-Claude Van Damme and Emily, who he got from the box, now go to get Tyler, who says, I didn't move, Dad. I never moved. And he's like, 
I know, but you probably should have at a certain point. I know I said not even if the walls were coming down, but that's a euphemism, not really meant to make you stay in a dangerous situation like this. But it was nice to be able to know where to find you. I mean, let's be honest. If uh, you had not been here, would not have been the biggest loss. Emily clearly is the brains of this outfit, so we wouldn't be losing cure for cancer or anything. We need to get her to a doctor. Her hands won't stop shaking. She has the cold thousand yard stare of a psychopath like a <laughs> sniper from vietnam or something but uh, we we should get him out of here uh so they embrace the secret service agent finds jean-claude van damme and is like you saved the vice president and you were a big hero while they're talking emily just goes wandering off in shock yeah right <laughs> you know once again nobody really paid attention to where emily is in this movie she sees powers booth in his disguise and recognizes him because of the stamp that she put on his hand that guy daddy that's the guy that made my adulthood a complete misery jean-claude van damme realizes oh my god where is my my little girl oh no powers booth has grabbed her again powers booth grabs emily and runs off which why would he do this he doesn't need a hostage well <laughs> also time check there are less than three minutes in this movie yeah and so jean-claude van damme says to this secret service agent hey do you mind watching my shitty son for a minute i don't care as much about him as the little girl but i'd be a little bummed if I, he were gone also it is his birthday if you can do something special like uh, you know, don't worry about it. Papa's coming, Emily! <laughs> yeah. So this helicopter in Under Siege 2 style rolls up on the dome of the Civic Center and rolls out a rope ladder to take Powers Booth away. And yeah. so Jean-Claude Van Damme chases them up into this scaffolding where he and Powers Booth end up scrapping some. Emily apparently is standing over a trap door. Correct. <laughs> And so Powers Booth is like, hey, I, at the very least, I'm going to kill this little girl. He hits a button. Yeah. And opens up this trap door. So she goes tumbling down, like holding on by her fingernails, yes. lest she fall to her death onto the ice. So uh, uh. through no help from Jean-Claude Van Damme, she manages to claw her way back up. <laughs> this rope ladder is now swinging beside Powers Booth. He pulls a gun and... Jean-Claude Van Damme like freezes like oh no he's about to shoot me and Powers <laughs> Booth says don't worry baby I'm not gonna shoot you I'm gonna leave you alive so you can think about how you couldn't save your little girl and so he aims the gun at Emily who keep in mind has just managed to claw herself <laughs> up from, from this trap door keep it, and this is at the top of this hockey arena I mean she's hundreds of feet in the air Jean-Claude Van Damme launches himself but between the gun and his daughter but that don't matter anyway because powers booth is hanging on to the rope ladder and it jerks or something and he just totally loses his gun yeah so he's just like ah oh, well to hell with that baby let me just climb up this ladder yeah and the zoot suit thug is the one piloting the helicopter as they're getting away powers booth makes it all the way up into the helicopter and jean-claude van damme takes powers booth's gun and just fires it into the belly of the helicopter above him mm -hmm. thankfully murdering not only the zoot suit thug but the pilot as well you left out an important detail not only does he shoot the gun up into the helicopter he does something even more baffling he runs over leaps into the air and grabs the rope ladder yeah so he's attached to the helicopter then he shoots it with his gun yeah i could see from the safety of the roof you do that why would you grab the ladder because it's cool looking so but he makes it back to the scaffolding <laughs> where he should have shot from in the first place yes a hundred percent and jean-claude van damme watches as the pilot of the helicopter slumps forward under the control pointing the helicopter straight down into the arena yep powers booth scrambles to try to right the helicopter and as the helicopter flies by in its nosedive towards the ice through the opening in the roof of the civic arena yeah jean-claude van damme and powers booth lock eyes yeah Yes. Then this thing goes face first into the ice, exploding. Yes. 
And Emily watches with the hard eyes of a killer to be as we see the reflection of the explosion in her eyes. I would love to see a movie about Emily's life in her 20s. <laughs> right, where she's all tatted up and is doing heroin <laughs> on the regular. It's a pretty good practical effect. It's dopey, but it's a nice practical effect that they dropped this helicopter and blew it up. So the last scene of the movie is Jean-Claude Van Damme on a stretcher with Emily riding on it as he is taken to a waiting ambulance and then you get tyler's there i think somewhat proud of his father both of them are like be careful that's my dad he's a hero he changes light bulbs and kills people <laughs> right and then end of movie just we roll credits on that and that is it that sudden death god bless that movie for knowing when to get out like we have seen this helicopter just explode i guess you kind of resolve the whole emotional arc of the story of like oh his kids are proud of him now one of them is definitely going to become a killer but the other one tyler's going to become a professional birthday clown <laughs> yeah i mean at <laughs> at best he is not going to land in a great place if i can make another kid's birthday awesome i'm gonna do it at the end of the day it is at least a movie that understands what it is and it delivers on pretty much everything you want out of a movie like this yeah, I think it disappointed girlfriends everywhere when it came out. Or maybe for people on a first date, they were like, mm, you know what? This shouldn't be a second date. <laughs> this is it. Right. <laughs> like I said, we, we watch a lot of crap on this show. This at least is entertaining. You know, it's I not mean, great. He, he beats up a giant penguin mascot. That had to influence the Peter Griffin chicken fight, right? Because of how long it goes on and just how crazy all the utensils are and that kind of thing like yeah, yeah you would think so so but we've done die hard on ice mm -hmm. we've done die hard on a cruise ship we did die hard on a mountain we did die hard on a train mm -hmm. what could we possibly do next to top ourselves or debase ourselves for the next episode of this season of pick six movies die hard on ice. well let me ask you this do you play roulette chad russian roulette uh, this is different. Then no. Well, a little bit of advice from our next movie is yes. that you should always bet on black. And in this case, we are betting on Passenger 57, a.k.a. Die Hard on a Plane. And also a circus. I think the original title of this movie was Passenger 57's Day at the Circus. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get into that in two weeks' time, but Passenger 57 is definitely our next movie. It was uh, one that, from early on, I think both of us were like, well, this has to be included in this season. Sure. Because this movie is ridiculous and also a sweet, sweet 83 minutes long. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Very nice. So that is it for Sudden Death, this episode four of our current season. As always, like, rate, review. You can reach out to us, pick6movies at gmail.com. We've been getting more and more email. We'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback and ideas for future seasons. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Sudden Death as we say goodbye or adieu, as uh, one might say? <laughs> oh, I would just like Emily to stop showing up late at night over my bed. She has the cold <laughs> eyes of a doll. <laughs> <laughs> She's gonna murder her dad. <laughs>